I'm Peter Mansbridge in Toronto. This is a special edition of Spittin' Chicklets. It's my duty to please the booty. And Muzz got mad at me, the coach said, he goes, Jesus Christ, why don't you just wear two nines? And I went, okay. Ah, ah, switch the call. Please, please, please never do that. Yeah, I, yep. So. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 484 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka, here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What is up, gang? Another wild week for the Chicklets crew. We've been on the road like, what, 10, 10 nights already this fucking month? Stadium Series, Chicklets cast, tore up Hoboken for a few nights. But we got to say hi to the boys first. Let's go to the biz man, Paul Biz Nasty. Biz on Net. the road again. Got more miles than the fucking space shuttle on him. What's up? Oh, no, 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 the road again. I don't know the words. I'm not, <laughs> really, it, I'm not really a word guy. But uh, <laughs> yeah, here's we know. Witty. Witty's running Ooh. to close the door. He's probably Uh-oh. got the kids One screaming. Of the kids is, but Wyatt just lit, lit a fucking fire, probably. I'll wait for him to sit <laughs> back down. We can't We can't start without yeah. Witty. We need him. We good, Witty? What? There he what? is. What's Wyatt, up, Witty? Wyatt we we didn't want to start without you, buddy. I just oh, wanted sorry, to talk I about... The keys. I'm pro- I apologize. I'm actually oh, recording bad. from uh, from G's chair right now. I'm in oh, Hoboken yeah. still. It's been a hell of a weekend in Hoboken. <laughs> got here Thursday. I will say I would consider... Getting a place here. You say that every oh. single place we go. But it is. Do I say I say that about a lot of a lot of places? Yeah, we say sitting at Cactus you're Club in Toronto. You're like, so. buddy, buddy. I, Dude, I, that I, town I is think about <laughs> moving back to Toronto, buddy. <laughs> you know, we're you know in what Denver it is? for the West Coast Finals, buddy. But <laughs> place is sick. No, 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 no. I said like a suburb, maybe. I wouldn't live downtown Denver. No, no, no. But I like but still, I like the like, lifestyle. You, you, of you get involved in every city we're in, and then you kind of like you could picture yourself living there. But then is, you, you think there is somebody there. who has a, a a place in fifty states? You think I there's somebody? But I doubt it. All 50, I'm going to be know. willing to say there's not one person that I'm, one. I, <laughs> I am going to buy a, a, a 500 square foot condo in every single state. This is like just challenge gonna, accepted. <laughs> <laughs> just do a little YouTube series of me just with these little whack pads all across oh. the country. Uh, but Hoboken, <laughs> awesome spot. Stabbing um, cabins. <laughs> st- couples. <laughs> that, exactly. But what oh, uh, awesome fuck. weekend. I mean, we're not going to dive into the hockey quite yet, but we got here Thursday. We had an event. It feels like a month ago is when we did the Chickles cast. But all in all, a great weekend here. Before we get into the nitty gritty of it, I, Wit, how have you been, buddy? You're you're down in Florida. You couldn't be here. We missed you, but we still had a heck of a fucking time. I know, and it looked awesome. Um, I, I, when we get into those games, we can go into it more in depth. But the the setup at that stadium, like I kind of, I kind of was a little down on it when they announced it. I'm like, oh, MetLife. Like, first off, I was like, how did that place get the World Cup final? That's in a few years. But still, I was like, I don't know. And then the way it looked, the crowds, the jerseys, the walking. Um, Outfits besides loser Lou and his no his no <laughs> character to the Islanders. I and fucking the, love it. Like what a donkey! But it, <laughs> it looked incredible. Like at least watching it on TV, and we we always say those are kind of more for the fans in attendance. It looked really good. And I don't know about you guys. You could tell me more. But was the ice? Were the players saying the ice was incredible? Maybe it was just those teams were all flying, but that was those were fast paced games. Oh, and they were snapping passes where like, they were all on the tape and stuff. I was very imp- impressed with how clean the hockey was. Normally, yeah, it's you a shit show at those events. They did delay the game yesterday afternoon about an hour. I heard that was because of sun. Now, th- there was also a million things flying around online. Is that to be true, G? Was it sun related? Yeah, I was told it was sun related. Okay, so there you go. Maybe it was because of potential uh, ruining the ice conditions with, but fucking unreal. Yeah, it, it looks sick. I was I was kind of rattled not to be there, but yeah, it's school vacation week. This this starts, so we planned a while ago visiting my parents in Estero. I mentioned they actually live right above uh, the Stahl brothers, their parents. So it's funny how that works out because my dad got to be friendly with his dad on the Penguins there, and then and then we're going Thursday to see my wife's parents on, on the East Coast. So we're doing about nine days down here, and it's it's beautiful. Obviously, the first day of vacation was was yesterday. We flew in on um. What we flying? Yeah, Saturday afternoon, then Sunday, first full day. It, it must have rained two and a half inches here. It was unbelievable. So went to Top Golf, killed a couple hours with the kids, but but now it's beautiful. And the next the next nine day forecast just looks about seventy five to eighty and sunny. So oh, it's awesome, yeah, baby. 
Oh, yeah. Actually, I was talking to Trevor Daly. He lives down here. Jonathan Bernier lives, lives down here. I might bring a rider over to skate. I guess Dales has uh, two boys in 08 and 09, both real good players. He's like, yeah, we skate Tuesday and Wednesdays. You can bring them over if you want. So might do that just to kill a little time in the morning. And uh, it's nice to be down here, though, man. You know, you know, Biz, I, I, but I, I could get a place down here. I could see myself living <laughs> down here. <laughs> I, I Let's love split the, a condo, court. Wit. When I come into town, I could stay with you and the kids and the family. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure you guys are with that. We'd be we we'd, we'd, <laughs> we'd have like a uh, uh, we'd have to be like spraying down the whole apartment after you were in here for a week alone. I'll buy myself a <laughs> plastic food on, on the furniture <laughs> down <laughs> and on your hog. Uh, Foul. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I love how the hockey quirk of like saying like the. The birthday. Nobody says the ages. In hockey's I, the only sport that does that. Like you just said, it's the hilarious. I was saying that to somebody recently. I forget. I was like, "Is your son a fifteen or a 16? And, and it was like a, a buddy's like, wife. She's like, whoa, "What?" <laughs> She's like, "What do you mean?" I'm like, "Oh, it's just like that's how hockey <laughs> players do it. They just go by the birth years. It's it, it's very funny how that works out." Yeah, well, I think only sport that does it. G Mike Granelli, busy week for you. Great job last week. How we doing, my friend? Uh, I'm doing great. Business in my uh, office right now, so I'm a little out of touch <laughs> right now. But uh, awesome. We can't thank everyone at uh, TNT in the NHL enough for allowing us to do that. Chicklets cast, the stadium here is awesome having it here. And I don't want to call it my hometown, but I, my home field. And uh, it's awesome. I'm going to actually going to North Dakota this week, too, for Chicklets U. So very excited for that. We have a merchandise collab coming out with them. I believe it's going to be available in their team store. So super, super excited to get to the Ralph. And uh it was awesome having you guys in town and, and being with you guys on the road for the past fucking month and a half. So the the Ralph is the Taj Mahal of, of <laughs> university barns, right? It's got like yes. gold plated toilets and shit. You're actually not wrong at all, Biz. They, the floors from the Ralph are the, it's the same stone used as the floors of the Vatican. So it's like they said, it, <laughs> is that legit? I, I heard you say that on game fuck notes. Get out of I my mean, kitchen with that that's shit. That's what they told really me. Bragging. I got on a call with North Dakota and they're like, first things first, the floors, no. Vatican floors. Okay. This has <laughs> right. Wikipedia written all over yeah. it. I need fish and Sean all behind the scenes here Googling that right now. And I'm going to wait for a little buzzer on my phone here as a text messages to confirm that. The fish Vatican. Fish was on the call. Fish heard him. Fish heard oh, him say yeah. it. <laughs> What's well, that yeah, movie yeah. that Nick Cage was in? The uh, National Treasure. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. I, I, know, no, I actually never saw that, but I mean, I, I I've always said that the the Chicago Blackhawks red uniform is my favorite NHL jersey. Mm -hmm. I, I think before North Dakota went from, I think they're not the Fighting Sioux anymore, are they? Oh yeah. No, the, the no, they're fighting like the Fighting Eagles now. Oh my fighting god. Hawks. Fighting Hawks, maybe fighting oh, those oh, old oh. those old Fighting Sioux jerseys. Hawk. Incredible. And I thought that it was always the rule that when Engelstad gave all that money to the hockey program and built the arena, I thought he put it in there that like they could never switch the name. That but was I guess there. at some point the, the the public pressure that they had to. What do you um, mean? What's the public pressure? Like the scrapping guy? They didn't the want it to be no, a public pressure is when the pressure PC. publics you to maybe get rid of yeah. like what's considered right. an offensive yeah so I, I skipped a step there i meant like what was so <laughs> offensive about it that there was a drunk guy scrapping no dude it was a, it was a Na sioux it was, yeah. Na <laughs> it, was, Na it was native american <laughs> indian oh yeah oh i thought that that i thought they used to have on their jersey kind of like the fighting irish where it was a. Uh, Oh, okay. no, so I think you're thinking an older name. But that, all the Biz, thought the, Biz thought the logo was like a, a, a logo for like peer pressure of like some kid holding like a roach in front of another middle schooler. He thought Rosie no, the no, 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 was no. no, I'm saying that because I used to go, fuck you. I used to go to Notre Dame Fighting Irish. So did yeah. they have to change the Fighting Irish? No, okay, so no, I got them mixed the, up. The, the Irish people, they they can just yeah. be Sioux. There can be drunk Fighting Irishmen everywhere, but Fighting Sioux, I, I don't understand. think at my high school anymore. I think at my high school, they got pressured to change it. And then maybe the, that's the why- Fighting they, Irish? They, yeah, you can't, they, wow. they didn't want the, yeah, the association to like a drunk Irish guy scrapping. That's how sensitive hey, we did, I thought I we got. We decide that as a Irish people. Yeah, I Irish, agree. Italians and Polish, I agree. Somebody on say. Twitter, please draw me up a, a logo for the North Keep Dakota. Keep in mind, um, I might have been smoking pressure. dope and completely imagined all of this. This could be a, 
one of those things <laughs> where it never even happened. Have the, the Sioux logo in in the back of every seat. I think he made sure that that would stay. Okay. So they told me when we're doing the tour, they're like, the Sioux logo is still plastered everywhere. <laughs> there's like, there's no, like, that's that's kind of how the floor conversation got brought up. Because they're like, yeah, like, we can't change the floors. Like, it's there's a big Sioux logo there. Like, it, 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 they're not changeable floors. It would cost too much. Okay. But it's the there's actually a really floors. good documentary on Amazon Prime about them changing the name from the Sioux to the uh, Fighting Hawks. And like the Sioux <laughs> they tribe. They got a dock out. Which Sioux tribe. Like, it, it, it's ridiculous. There's a dock yeah. about everything now. Yeah, Biz. Remember when? No. I don't know. Probably 30. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, they slap up on Netflix. They're usually like produced by the person it's about. So they keep all the dirty shit out of it half the time. So. But Biz, remember like, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, they started like, there was a drum beat, no pun intended, for, like to get rid of like Native American names. And, you know, it was mostly yes. like white liberals complaining, it seemed like all the time. And, because I was at North Adams and we were the Mohawks. They they started trying to change the name. And I, like I was the editor of the school paper. And that's when I realized how much fucking power you could have. Like with that, we we, we just like completely shut it down. Then like, 10 years later, they ended up changing it to the, the fucking trailblazers and some stupid name. Yeah. But when you, but yeah, I don't, you think I'm, I don't think I'm qualified enough to talk about all this. So, uh, no. but uh, should we, should we, we got to go back to TNT boys. It feels like I it was a month ago. I can't believe that we, we, I thought that was a month ago. Like you said, it was. when I no, saw the was. outline, we had to go over TNT. I was like, <laughs> well, we haven't done a show since then. Oh my God. Well, we got what in there Tuesday. Though. Biz, I got to shout you out before we shout out everyone at TNT and, you know, Biz loves giving out the thank yous and they're well deserved Love the on this. Yous. Biz, you kind of put this in their ear originally about like possibly doing this. And I think the Manning cast was a big um, jump off for like different way to broadcast games. And the best thing that I saw was somebody mentioned on Twitter, like if you were fully invested fan of one of, of either Pittsburgh or Florida, maybe you'd want to watch the game with the announcers. But if you're just looking to watch a hockey game and, and just, you know, you just kind of have it on on the on the on the on the outside and you're doing other things. I thought it was a great idea. Well, obviously, we're biased. We got to do it. But it ended up being way better than I even thought. And I think it really helped that the Penguins were one of the teams because we had a bunch of different stories of our days back in back. Yeah, in it was Pittsburgh. like paying homage to our roots. And, and especially as a podcast, like, you know, now that Army and Merles are on board, that's where we all met. Right. So we share a lot of the same experiences and stories coming up through our careers. And I mean, all four of us touched the American Hockey League where most of the nonsense takes place. And it was it was just a a, a perfect broadcast to to be able to start this out on and and uh, at least have something to fall back on from like a guest perspective and it just all worked out incredibly and uh, I'm I'm so grateful that we got that it got to happen now I don't even know if it was necessarily my idea I want to say Craig Berry at at, uh, at TNT came to me with it where he called me in a couple months ago and he put it in my ear and I was like. Yeah, I'm like, we, we we used to do these more, especially during the pandemic, but we love hopping on the live streams or wh whatever, what is it, StreamYard or whatever app we're using that's updated at that time. And, you know, having these special guests come on board. So it was a perfect collaboration. And as you guys know, and you guys will be able to speak to it now, and you always joke about all the thank yous I snap around, but they make your life pretty easy. You go in there and if fuck, they, they're wiping your ass the entire time. There's 14 runners ready to get you a Morton steak. It's, and then of course the production side of things and how professional they are. So even when we got there on Tuesday to cut all those fun promos and RA, you were the star of the promos, buddy, you fucking leaned right into it. Like you crawling with the rose in your mouth and really <laughs> getting that, that Valentine's day spirit going. So you, I'll let, I'll hand it over to you guys. Like what was your experience working there and, and with all those professional and amazing people? It was just fun, man. I mean, I, I'm like you, Biz. I'm a ham and egg. I love cameras. I love doing goofy shit like that. And just the, the idea that we, we were on fucking TV, on true TV, and, and streaming on Max, like watching a hockey game. It's it's kind of surreal to say even a week later. But I had a fucking ball, man. I, I thought it was out, outstanding. I think, well, I'm sure it's probably not going to be the only time we do it. But uh, I one thing I did like when Hank come on, and, and, you know, obviously I'm probably not the best dressed guy on the show here. And, uh, they asked him about what wardrobe, and he's like, you know what? Ari owns it. Like, when he wears it, when he wears, he owns it. I, I love like, it. Shit, Hank. Hank got my back for my shitty wardrobe, but it was great. And just to go back to your point of how it originated, I think it was Bill Galvin, actually, uh, Biz, because when I met him I don't know, the first time a couple of years ago, he kind of hinted, like, oh, maybe we'll see what happens. Maybe we'll have you on one day. So I kind of I was like, oh, I wonder what he meant by that. And then, you know, a couple of years later, it came to fruition. So uh, uh, hats off to Bill, man. He's, he's the man. So Billy G and OC, these are two guys who helped produce uh, uh, the TNT broadcast. 
yes, they probably went to Craig Berry and there was probably a meeting at some point about them wanting to do this. And like, gee, you could speak more to it. Like Billy G was kind of the producer and quarterback of all of it. He helped up set up the interviews, you know, when we would go to commercial breaks. So he did a tremendous job and gee, you got to work in the producer chair and kind of see how they operated. But we also throwed our own bar stool slash spit and chicklets twist where we had the chat going the whole time. Like we had the fun guests as we normally do. Like you were bringing up like some of the tweets from from our whack pack outside of just things yeah it was awesome yeah. man i thought it was it was so cool in the fact that they trusted us like for for someone who i mean i haven't sat in a control room in 10 years and the last time i was in a control room i was scrolling the teleprompter at channel seven so for me to be able to sit in a producer chair and for them to trust me when i say things like hey go to this now and bill's like all right we're going like they didn't even think twice about anything i said so like when like right off the bat, we had the Singsy tweet and I'm like, we got to get the Singsy tweet up. And they're like, who the fuck is Singsy? I'm like, I'm telling you, Singsy's will, Singsy will play. Singsy will definitely play. They get it up and it played. So the trust that they put in us to, to do this, I thought was just unbelievable. And yeah, it was just an awesome time. And, and just to go to what you were saying quickly, it's like bringing up Singsy just kind of makes us feel a little bit more comfortable because he's someone from our world, right? So we're trying to connect the two and like, TNT really allowed us to be our our authentic selves, but also like we're not like making helicopter cock jokes and stuff. Like we're fi- we're really fine in that line. As tempted as I was to make a helicopter cock joke with, like, but like we were able to be ourselves and 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 tell all the stories we n- normally would on this podcast. Yeah, and the nerves weren't too bad. I think because we were just sitting there talking like we do on this pod. I wasn't really nervous beforehand. Granted, like there's a, there, there's so many people that work at those big time studios. Probably a little bit like unnecessary. I'll say at least it, it comes off that way because there's so many people. Everyone always obviously has a job to do. But you're sitting there and you're looking. We probably had like 15 people just like looking at us on the broadcast. But it was great because we had this huge screen to watch the game. And then we interviewed Kachuk beforehand, and you could talk about Matt. Matthews, Kucherov, Hellebuck, McDavid. Kachuk might be the best player in the league right now. He leads the league at scoring since January 1st. So all of a sudden, boom, he comes on. Obviously, he gets a few points. That's standard. We have his dad on. We have Brady on. So we had the whole Kachuk family join. Having talk at the end was great. My three favorite parts of the night. I don't know how to put these in order. I'll start with one. Biz was basically kind of hosting this. He's the TV oh. guy. He was used to it. <laughs> watching biz try to like get to commercial like in time it was an absolute disaster at, at some moments but hilarious because he's like ah, ah, and people are talking I said and finally i'm like how the fuck does liam McHugh do this every time while he's got my babbling idiot breath in his face like oh my god like shut the hell up and you were like I was like tapping your leg, basically, like being like, I got to send this thing to break. Well, at one point it went to commercial mid interview between like Lundquist and Talkit. And I think like all of a sudden, like Lundquist is still asking a question. There's like a Geico commercial on the huge screen. I'm (laughs) like, I think we're off air right now, bud. And then that was obviously a battle for you, but you did a good job. You did a good job. My second favorite, my second favorite, getting the makeup done. So for the the day before we did the little show in terms of um, the pre-show, right? Where Ari is crawling around. We had the whole walk and they did an awesome job. We came in, we bodied Jazzy Jeff, and then we kind of did our thing. We put the tuxes on, but we didn't have makeup. I'm like, ah, this is kind of tough. No makeup, right? But all of a sudden, the next day, we get the makeup on. I'm getting the makeup on. I'm like, this is nice. This is really going to help me. You know what she said to me? Hey, I got a little spray to cover up a couple of the bald spots. I'm like, yes. <laughs> she like sprayed something on my hair that was like, the color of my hair. I was like, this is unbelievable. I look like I got a full head of hair right now. Thank you so much. And then the third. We finish up, and everyone's flying high, right? It was a success, really good feedback. People seemed to really enjoy it. We had fun doing it. And so we were going to meet like a bunch of people from TNT and just have a drink at this local pub right near our hotel. Me, Merles, and R.A. pull up to this pub. All of a sudden, R.A., oh, oh, I love this place. I left I left my wallet here last time I was there. <laughs> Holy <laughs> shit. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Didn't lose my room key, though. That is so good. I don't know how I get home some nights. (laughs) Yeah, we know. Whit here, and I'm here, you know it, to talk about Pink Whitney. As I mentioned, I'm down in Florida, and first thing I see when I went to a local establishment here was a couple of people ordering 
pink Whitney shots. It felt great. And did I mention that I was the inventor of the drink? No, nope, no, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. I did not do that. I just let them enjoy their drink. I saw actually one guy took it and said, oh, I love this. I was so happy. I was so happy to see. And I, I hope all of you out there are enjoying pink Whitney, whether it's mixing it up with some soda water, doing it as a shot, or buying the big old monster bottle, 1.75. So as I'm in the warm weather, it's a little easier to imagine being out on a boat or being on the beach, or being at the pool, and enjoying your nice pink Whitney chilled on the rocks like I like it. But up north, where it's still cold out, we're still dealing with winter, warm on up with a little pink Whitney, New Amsterdam's own. Without New Amsterdam, we're nothing. That is who created this, and, and I, I cannot thank them enough, but we want to shout out New Amsterdam, the pink lemonade-flavored vodka that's number one in your heart, and keep on buying it, and go to the local bar, in your town, and order up a shot for me. I appreciate it, and I love you all. Yeah, all in all, it was a huge, uh, huge week. And uh, I, once again, just thank you to everybody at TNT. I hope that we're able to do this again. Um, and and you kind of said it, like Hank coming on, he kind of got jammed up. I would have liked to have had more Hank. And, uh, and that was so cool that he had your back. Maybe you and him kind of start like a fashion line already. He, I, maybe he starts dressing like you. He just yeah. like switches it up completely. Goes to all the baggy suits, baggy clothes. And I maybe the Blackhawks change their nickname to public pressure. <laughs> <laughs> to a fighting Irish yeah. guy on the front I of the jersey. <laughs> but he's Italian. <laughs> All right, yeah. we got to talk about the the basketball shot. I thought that was uh, we talked yeah. about TNT putting trust in us. I remember in the production meeting when we said we got to let RA shoot hoops at one point. And they're like, "What?" And I'm like, "Every time there's a video of RA shooting hoops, it goes viral." And this time, you nail it in the Kevin McHale jersey, dude. That felt so fucking great because we were in the inside the NBA studios. They did it over for us, and Charles Barkley said when we interviewed him, the toughest competitor he. He played against was Kevin McHale. Obviously, I'm a Boston guy, so I brought my old school Mitchell and Nets jersey, put it on. I, I know I airballed the first couple. I think it was the fifth shot, though. Right when I let it go, it I was like, I said, I goes, it's on. Yep. And the, I hit that. I was like, thank God, a national TV man. I fucking didn't go over ten, so that was pretty fucking sweet. I ain't gonna lie, G. And you beat you beat the Penguins power play, which has been fucking dog shit. They're still losing. They're not gonna make playoffs. They well, this is a joke. It, it not only I mean, lost Sunday. them that game. I mean, well, it didn't lose them that game, but it was a big part they, of it. And then, and then Yager night, they give up a shorty to lose the game. <laughs> it's fucking pathetic. I mean, some uh, amazing moments from that game, though. I mean, the whole week, uh, uh, Crosby going on during warmups with the, with the mullet. I mean, would so you have sick. ever thought in a million years? That was so sick. I mean, uh, everyone wearing it, and then him getting to practice before. Do we want to talk about that right now? Maybe. Yeah. Let, yeah. We're already into it. Yeah. Yeah. So we mentioned last episode, or maybe two episodes ago, that they were doing it. It was Sunday night, and it was going to be a big deal. And I kind of talked about that Rob Rossi article in which there were old memories of Yager as a Penguin, and then to see him go back and like see the love for him. And obviously, there's been a ton of jersey retirements and cool ceremonies and all these different types of things for these legendary players on all these different teams. But I don't know, man, the practice the day before doing warm ups, everything that went involved to it, like it's 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 Briere, it's um, the guy Briere's retired by the Penguins, he passed away and then Lemieux and Jagger. And so it's like it, it was it's, it's so memorable and meaningful for that organization. They don't have a lot of numbers up there like the Celtic. I think the Boston Celtics have 25 numbers retired and you understand it in certain teams and the success they have. But Pittsburgh's had this legendary run since 1990. And it's like he's the second guy, like the, the second superstar to go up there along with Mario. And and I think that all the fans getting to see him and go back and he just after we interviewed him, I didn't know a ton about him. He seems like such a great guy. We got to experience him quick. Granted, it was over Zoom, but I don't know. Like even him up in the booth, he was doing some color with Phil Bork, and it was just a great night. I mean, unfortunately, they couldn't get the win for him, but that was so that had that had been coming for so long, and to finally see it go down the way it did and have that weekend be such a success, it was just awesome. And Penguins fans were fired up; they were lined out the door for it. Just such a legendary player. I I think I sent you guys the the um the tweet I saw from nine unbelievable. To from the, 93 from the to the numbers 2001, perspective or 92 to 2000 he he was Connor McDavid like same numbers like it was you you kind of forget i guess he's 51 years old you forget that was the most dominant force maybe one of the most dominant forces the league's ever seen oh absolutely dude and i, oh, do, I mean do you have some of those numbers RA? can you read yeah. them off yeah, I got like it right it's, here. It's, it's pretty insane you, you're not exaggerating either wit now before, while you look that up did you it, see <laughs> 
see the speech part when he says, my girlfriend's probably too young to remember and it pans over. She's probably like 23 years old, just an absolute <laughs> missile. The fact that he like called <laughs> himself out. Can we roll the clip? I want to say thanks to Dominica, my girlfriend. Uh, she's too young to remember. I played in Pittsburgh, but I... <laughs> I, but I told her all the stories, so don't worry about it. Like, come on, man. That's fucking top tier. And, and, and at the end, Robert but don't Lang's worry, I told her him. all about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, my God. Like, like unbelievable. Oh, I, I mean, I hate to like, I, I don't I, I don't know if it's appropriate to bring it up. Wasn't it a couple of years ago? There was a video that went viral where a young girl was like, I'm going to post that we slept together. And he's like, I don't give a shit. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Like, <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, she make, it, gonna fucking make it your Raya profile picture. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was oh, in man. bed asleep. He Here, was, I'll like, get sleeping. you an Uber, but that's the only money you're getting. <laughs> And he dropped the uh, an F-bomb, too. With. Did you catch that? When he was on TV, he let a fucking F-bomb slip. Yeah. Uh, if you thought that as well. Here's a but signed I, puck in, in, uh, in one of my NFTs. <laughs> Actually, I got a stamp out, too, here. It's a collect. <laughs> Beat it. They got to get that guy in the Hall of Fame. Second he's not in the Hall of Fame. In the history of the league, man. No, because he still plays professional hockey, and you got to be out, away from pro hockey for three years. He's still playing technically pro hockey over at Gladden. So he's, he's kind of the, the European how. And he's also, um, he, he's like, uh, um, it's like Gino to Sid, to, to you know, to, to Mario, right? It's, he, he was the right-hand guy. It, it would be like if, if Dreisaitl and uh, McDavid go on. Why did it take so long for Pittsburgh to do it? I don't know, man. People were kind of talking about that and, and wondering. And I, I don't want to say there was bad blood. I think he necessarily didn't want it. Like, it seemed like he was distancing himself a little bit. And then I said last week how he kind of, he made it sound like he thought people didn't like him there, and, and he always got booed. I mean, it wasn't because they didn't like him. It was just because he was so good. He was dominating them. I mean, I remember coming into the league when he was on the Rangers. Oh, my God. I think the oh, one year he had 120 points. It might have been my rookie season. He was You couldn't get the puck from him. Like, so 6'3", about 230, 240, sick hands, use his ass to protect the puck. It was just oh, yeah. so dominating. And I, and I think that there was, like, a lot of time where he was just kind of – he was turned off by Pittsburgh, maybe personally, and in the end, like time, time heals all wounds, and and finally, like he kind of came to the realization, like people love me there. I got, I got to be up in the rafters. I love it. Yeah, wait, I, I don't know if it was bad blood, but there was, you know, maybe some animosity there. The way he left, you know, he wanted to stay, and he, I, he what did he leave for Washington first, and put yeah. the money there. Then he was in Philly. And, oh, know, he got he just, the bag and washed, didn't he? Was yeah. he making like ten million a year back then? Maybe more. Yeah. He was definitely, I think he was the highest paid player for a couple of seasons there, but yeah, but it's, it's good. They patch things up because that, you know, life's too short to fucking not have fucking Yarmir Yager's number retired. It took way too Dude, long. Dude, I read a that tweet when he, when he was 41 or 42, he finished seventh place in MVP voting when he was on the Panthers. Like it, it, this guy was, it was just insane. He did it for so long. And, and right now he's playing to keep that team alive. Like he told us, like Cladno was in you know, financial disarray. And so he's playing to help the organization. It's just like, get him in the Hall of Fame because his Hall of Fame speech is, is, is going to be amazing. <laughs> and, and even... He's, with, got, he's got four rockets sitting front row. <laughs> <laughs> like, but when he was with the Bruins that year, what, 2013? I mean, he was still pretty fucking productive player. I don't think he got a goal, but he yeah. was, I mean... Was, he got I think, one. It went off his ass, I remember. Oh, shocker, right? Uh, I got those numbers right here. from Yaga from 93 to 2001, McDavid from 16 to 24. Each had five scoring titles, MVP finals five times. Uh, in 570 games, Yaga had 346 goals, 859 points. McDavid had 308 goals, 873 points. Wow. Basically, uh, three-point difference on an 82-game pace. And I guess if you adjusted them for the era, uh, 607 games. Basically, the 952 points for Yaga, 941 for McDavid. It is. It's stunning how close those numbers are. You know, McDavid, yeah, it might not be the first thing you think of, I guess, when you're comparing uh, players from different generations, but fucking. No, the just to show how right dominant And the was, amount though. of punishment he would take. Buddy, he was playing a, in that day, man. Oh. You could hook and hold and slash. Oh, my 
God. Yeah, slash, go around a defenseman. Here comes the tomahawk from Darian Hatcher. Oh, that didn't do enough. Here comes a jaw right into the end wall. Yeah. <laughs> or or an elbow to the jaw, the- excuse me. <laughs> How about uh, I saw a picture of uh, Lemieux, Yager, Crosby, and Malkin and 15 scoring titles between them. So it's just pretty sick to think of the Penguins having four of the greatest players, you know, we've ever seen. Like, like we're, we're together, the two of them were together if, for different amazing runs. So it's, it's just been, it's been a great story and it was kind of the perfect cap to his career as a Penguin. And I think Yager's the one who said, when you think of me, when people think of me, they think of the Penguins, right? Yeah, oh, Absolutely. Yeah. I'm yeah, glad we kind of got sidetracked there because we skipped over the whole weekend part. And but you mentioned his some of his best years. Did he win the MVP when he had that monster year with the Rangers? Was he like the heart winner and all that? I, I believe so. I believe he did. Let me check. And that. then uh, adjusted for inflation, I wonder what those guys were making. Like at the at the like in the late '90s, some guys making ten, ten and a half million. What would that be considered to today's day? Like if it's Probably late 20. 90s, it's like the, those guys are making more, way more than, than they are now. Yeah, no, I'd say probably 20 million like, if you were to adjust for inflation, Paul. That's what I'd guess. Wow. Uh, Thornton got MVP that season. Yaga had 54 goals, 123 points in 05, 06, and, and Thornton got MVP. That was the year okay. he was traded. <laughs> oh, he won God. the heart in 99. It's the year Yager won it. So I guess <laughs> we can start with our uh, Hoboken, New York trip. And I mean, we got in on Thursday. The coolest thing, uh, one of the coolest things of the weekend that were, was non-hockey related, at least to the, the MetLife experience, was R.A.'s movie. I went to the movie screening for the late game. What a time that was. So Jeff Zucker, the guy who we originally got uh, partnered with, with the Colorado Springs ECHL team, he did a, a side project. And it was this movie that he did with a bunch of his buddies, R.A., right? Like, they just, yeah. they all yeah. got together, wrote a script very creatively. I don't know. What, did they go somewhere and take mushrooms and write it? Was that what happened originally? I didn't hear that version of the story, but it certainly wouldn't shock me if that's how it, if that's how it okay. played out. But, yeah, since they were little, little kids, him and uh, him and um, his buddy Jeff, they basically talked about this for years. And, you know, Zucka self-financed that there were only, like, two, you know, quote-unquote professional actors in the movie. He got a bunch of his friends and who played beer league, beer league games, and you could kind of sort, get that essence from it. But Biz, I've talked about it enough. What did you think about the movie, and what was the, your, whole, your whole overall sense of everything? Well, I, was, I thought it was cool that he did it with all his buddies. They did it 15-day span where they were going long hours, R.A., so this was like yeah. a mom-and-pop project that got executed perfectly. Um, I thought the, the message was awesome, and it was about originally the, the main actor at the start of the movie. You could tell he's going through a breakup. They go over that pretty vaguely and quick, where he bumps into an old buddy that they played uh, uh, men's league one night together. And, you know, you could tell the guy's in a bit of a rut because of the breakup. And the guy kind of entices him, hey, come out to men's league tonight. So, you know, after giving it thought, and then the guy's kind of very persistent about it, he ends up coming out to the men's league game. And it's just a very fun dynamic about how the other team where there were the bunch of heroes, where they had all the good players, where they had the guy who took it way too seriously. Uh, you know, uh, Zach Bell was in it as that team sniper who was just like filthy with the hands, but was kind of like giving it back to the guy who was taking it too seriously. And then all of RA's team, or, or sorry, all of uh, um, Jeff Zucker's team, they were just a bunch of plugs who were doing it for fun in the stories. They had a couple pothead, uh, potheads on the team. And it just did a good job of describing the whole full dynamic of men's league and what it's about and how it kind of got this guy out of this rut in his life. And RA was the, um, he was like the grumpy Zamboni driver. And he did a he did a tremendous job. R.A., you I get- thought you crushed it. I thought in terms of acting, you had far more lines than I expected. You were definitely much more of a main character than I expected. But your acting, your acting was incredible. I, I was so happy for you. So bravo, R.A. I thought it was boy, tremendous. RA. Boys, I, and honestly, I, I mean, I know, you know, we had a busy schedule lot going on. It meant the world to me that you guys, uh, Merles and Memes came to it. Because, you know, I know we had a lot going on and people were tired, hung over. So I want to thank you guys for coming. It, it did mean a ton. And the fact you enjoyed it. And, had nice things to say, made it even better. So thank you guys. It really did mean a, a lot to me. Again. Buddy, we we always want to support a teammate. We love the arts too. So so doing stuff like that and you branching out is huge, buddy. I hope you keep doing it. I mean, it's like this, Shorzy, you know you're just going to get keep offering, or getting offered, excuse me, more roles. Um, and I thought it was smart that they did, they obviously did this because of the MetLife experience, knowing that people would be in town. So they mm-hmm. rented a local theater for a showing on, on uh, it was Friday at 3.30 and 9.30. Was there showings on Saturday as well? 
Uh, no, but they did win in between 3.30 and 9.30 for a bunch of NHL uh, guys in the NHL office. They came over that wanted to see it as well. So, yeah, it's it's definitely going to be a word of mouth thing. I don't know. It's most likely going to hit Amazon by the end of the month. I think they're just still uh, crossing T's and dot and I's, but it should be available for rent by the end of the month. And Yeah, I hope everybody gives it a whirl. It's, it's a fun little movie. There's never been a beer league movie before, and, you know, you could fucking see me be fucking angry and pissed off like real method act that I had going there. I love it. It was a it was a good kickoff to the weekend, and then later that night we had the the Pink Whitney appearance. That was awesome, and that was at what Texas Arizona. Yeah, yeah. Texas yeah. Arizona, right in downtown Hoboken, right by the path. Awesome, awesome spot. And you know, How about Posh on the mic. Yeah, that was that was classless. Just what the hell are there. you doing, Posh? Jesus, he's Christ. getting real oh, yeah. comfortable. I think at this point, boys, it's time for a sussy. I don't know if he's on right now, but I think a four-pod sussy sounds about appropriate the way he's been handling himself lately, especially with the fact that on Hockey Night in Canada, after hours with Scott Oak, they brought up a clip of, of Pasha and, or excuse me, it was of Brock, Brock Besser defending, having defend his fucking teammate on the podcast about being a power play merchant. Why don't we roll it? Uh, your teammates are often asked, what's J.T. Miller really like? And the answer seems to be consistently that, look, he's a good teammate and all he wants to do is win. So Brock Besser was on a recent episode of Spit and Chicklets, and he was, as per usual, asked about you. I think the question came from Pasha and a comment. Uh, he's a part of the Split, uh, Spitting Chicklets crew. The comment that he made was that you had succeeded because you were a power play merchant this was brock besser's response yeah i wouldn't say that's true i think the, the reason i score five on five is because of millsy i mean <laughs> i think i personally think millsy is one of the best uh guys down low with the puck in the it's hard to get from him like he's he's so good yeah so did brock besser nail it oh he killed it perfect <laughs> look like i'm paying him to say that no it's uh you know brock and i are really good buddies i think our relationship has come so far since our first year here um, like I said, other guy that I feel like we can talk about anything together and uh, played a lot of hockey games, you know, as uh, line mates. And um, we're still pushing each other. And I think we're getting to that point where we're really hungry and trying to feed off each other and stuff like that. Do you know how so disgusted, I don't know what you think. You know how disgusted he must have been? He's like, I, like he must want to murder Pasha. And I really hope he does. And like, obviously, like JT Miller has just proven Pasha wrong time and time again. He's got two goals today, by the way. He's got two goals today. They're winning five. To oh, sorry. He just got the hat trick. <laughs> no. <laughs> Come on. on You're five on sure he's got a hat hopefully, trick. Hopefully no hopefully way five that just five. fucking happened. You're fucking with us. He's got a hat trick. He just got a hat trick. They're up five to two right now. Posh oh, is but, such a loser. But oh. I mean, for, for, but you know what I'm saying? Like Miller's like on after hours, his big deal. And he's like, I'm answering questions about this motherfucker, Pasha. Like, get. Oh, oh here, my you God. You idiot. Oh, no. He's got a hat oh. trick today. This is, the worst, this is turning out Sin to be the worst. Take of all time. Oh no, Pasha, say your Listen. piece because it's going to be a four pod sussy. We won't even. Listen. Anytime we say your name, it's going to get bleeped off the pod. Nobody will know you exist other than the sandbagger we have coming out. What do you have to say listen, for yourself? Well, I, uh, listen, I have a message to the city of Vancouver and the fans of the Canucks. Um, I know I made some controversial takes earlier this year, and after lots of reflection and and watching the level that JT Miller has been performing at all year, you know. I really feel that this needs to be said to the city of Vancouver. You are welcome. You are welcome. If it <laughs> wasn't for me lighting a fire under his ass with those oh comments, he games, would still so be the mediocre five on five, bad defensively, power play merchant bomb that he's been for years. So just like Biz galvanized the Rangers with his chirps, I lit a fire under Miller's ass and you're welcome, city of Vancouver. You're welcome. And I would even go so far as to say if the Canucks go to run and win a cup, I think I deserve a ring. We need a mute button. Oh we God, need a gosh. goddamn Did mute you button. you take acid with your fucking weed this morning? Holy I mean, I will, say, I will say that is something that I would say. So I feel like <laughs> I've been hanging out with him too much and it is rubbing off on him. I will take partial responsibility for this. But as, as of right now, I have the gavel in my hands. Four pods, Susty. Posh, Ashkey, you're gone. That's it. Four pods. We will not say his name other than... I guess if we're going to talk about the sandbagger, we have a special one coming out soon. Sean Avery, and we're going to be talking about the devil. So, oh my God, now Sean Avery's name's coming up. Him and Kevin Conley put on an absolute show. We end up going into, should we say no, it? No, 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 don't say anything. Don't okay, say anything. bleep it out, bleep it out. We have an awesome sandbagger coming up soon. And also, let's talk about the vlog right now. 
before we get into the MetLife experience. We have an amazing, amazing vlog hitting the YouTube channel on Wednesday of the entire All-Star experience. This is the most star-studded vlog I've ever seen. Shout out to Sean Apuzo, Pasha. Uh, there, there's no, one no, more. No, 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 bleep, bleep it. Bleep it. <laughs> and Elliot Fish, who did all the editing, I believe. Incredible job, incredible vlog. We got Wayne Gretzky in it, uh, Sam Reinhardt, Sebastian Aho, uh, Will Arnett, uh, Memesy, who's now the fucking star of the show. Do you have any other names you want to throw in there? Uh, I think without a doubt, the funniest part of this vlog is Terry Ryan Sr. showing up out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. No one knew this guy was coming. He just arrives in the green room after the show. But there's actually a lot of cool elements to this vlog where like, we're showing the like behind the scenes of the live show and leading yep. up all day to the show and us thinking of the ideas of the show. And it's it's probably our best episode of Chicklets TV yet. And it's coming out 6 p.m. Wednesday. And you can find that on all video platforms. Oh, yeah. Your boy Bowie was in it quite a bit too, Biz. Actually, I Bowie, one, one note gritty. on. We're, we're not done Sewer and Pasha. So when Conor Bedard uh, broke his job, me and, me and Pasha have a steak dinner uh, wager on how many goals Bedard's going to have. 31 and a half. So when he broke his jaw in January, he sent me a, a, a fucking text with his Venmo. He's like, in case you want to tidy up your bookkeeping early in January for a guy with a broken jaw. I was like, are you fucking stoned? He's got fucking, what he got? 16 goals. He's got 27 games left to fucking score 16 more to hit this thing. But like, who tries to cash out a fucking season long bet in January? I think we got to go six fucking episodes on now. Wow. Really All right. You don't <laughs> normally come over the top on guys. Well, he's usually getting sussied. <laughs> six six episodes. I mean, come on, fucking people, if you want to tidy up. Come on, that's fucking chintzy as hell. Like, the fucking kid might still fucking hit the 32 goals, plus it's only January. But anyways, enough of the posh shit. Okay, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at DraftKings. Gang, we're so excited to announce our partnership with DraftKings Sportsbook. DraftKings will be our one-stop shop for all things betting. And this week, new customers who deposit $5 or more could get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 on any sport. What's a no-sweat bet? It's just like getting an offensive board. Miss your first shot, you get another chance to score with a bonus bet back. Oof, good stuff. You can also follow what all your favorite Barstool personalities are betting by joining the Barstool betting group in the social section of the DraftKings Sportsbook app. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code CHICKLETS. New customers can get a no-sweat bet up to $1,000 if your first bet loses, only on DraftKings Sportsbook with the code CHICKLETS. A crown is yours. Stadium Series, Biz. Great time. Oh. I think everybody who won had a blast. I know people will complain about the outdoor games for whatever reason. And like you said, it's for the people there. But I think everyone really enjoyed it. I mean, Bettman was on Good Morning America today for five, ten minutes with Strahan talking about it. It seemed like the NHL really like actually owned the weekend quite a bit one so hopefully they can uh, make this an annual tradition like johnny lazarus right gee he said make it like a beat Th party. this maybe this sparked a whole debate online right and i think johnny lazarus was the first one to to kind of tweet this out saying should this be an every year thing from experiencing it myself i think that hockey needs more festival type days especially on the weekends like it's basically a full day. You bring your kids early. You get to get go through all these different experiences, maybe in different lots. Like some lots are more for like partying and drinking and tailgating. Others, like, like I went and did something for Discover where you got to take photos with fans. They have the big air hockey table out. They have a, a shooting thing. This was incredible. I mean, they, they even did a, a Jonas Brothers concert two hours before the show, a full concert, not just a few songs, full concert. Awesome. Hey, I'm, I don't typically crank the Jonas Brothers, but I thought every tune, like I was like, oh, I know this song. I know this song. They rocked the place. You got to get into the uh, arena at six o'clock. They did that all the way up to game time at eight o'clock. Uh, holy fuck, the amount of Devils fans that were there. And from the fandom experience, both games looked basically sold out. It was awesome. The energy was incredible. Rangers and Devils fans took over, though. It was kind of expected for... Um, for because Philly was out of territory, disappointed at the amount of Isles fans, but the games, the show they put on, and everything leading up was fucking 10 out of 10. I think that this should be an every year thing. And gee, you brought up a good point when we were talking earlier this afternoon. You seem to think that the uh there should be an outdoor experience for the NHL All-Star game, even. I think I think move the All-Star game outdoors. I think you know, if we're gonna if we're we're 
it's all about the fans, right? We talk about all the time about how these outdoor events, the all-star game, all these NHL marquee events, it's about the fans in person. So why not put it outdoors? I even said, go to Quebec City, bring it up to Quebec City. That would be an awesome, awesome time. Have a winter festival out there and just do make it this big party. I think it could be know, awesome. But it turns into the numbers game where, where the, the owners want the gate. That's like why they want those all-star games is because they get all the money from it. Yeah, but but it, so the, you like, get a bigger gate at an outdoor stadium. More I know, people I are going to go. How that would work? I, that's a cool idea. I I in terms of like every year doing it. I mean, you could do like the four those four teams you just did, and then another year you could do um, Boston, Montreal, Toronto, and like say Buffalo. Another year you could do Vancouver, Winnipeg, Edmonton, Calgary. Another year you could do. Uh, Dallas Mini, like Nashville, Colorado, like you could kind of do like four division rivals. Obviously, I, I mentioned teams in different divisions there, but right. it, it would be a pretty sick idea to, to, to every year maybe switch it to like four teams and then every four or five years they play and it's like one of those things because that that weekend was awesome. And and in terms of the actual games, that's what I like. They were at, Even though it was 6-3 the first night, it was closer game than that it felt like. Yeah, yeah, no, it was good, good, good action for sure. Now, uh, it made sense, though, because of the amount of population that you could sell out a building that big back-to-back -back games. Yeah. Um, I, I would definitely like to see them, like you said, come back every three, four years. Now, you say for the, the like a four-team meetup, would you do it in like Calgary and then have the Battle of Alberta? And like, what other two teams would you have come meet it? Well, it could be like Van and Winnipeg, like in terms of Western Canada. You know what I mean? And like... Uh, actually, quickly about this week, they they obviously announced like 150 thousand for both games. W was it sold out? Was it just one of those announced sellouts, or was it completely packed? I don't well, know. Saturday looked fucking. Sunday jammed. was no. Sunday was 100 percent sold out. Wow. I'd say on on Saturday they did this thing behind the net where they had pyrotex. Yeah. It was like a full section of just like fire just coming out. I don't the think Jonas they would Brothers. waste. I don't think they'd waste a full section. I I don't know if they sold all the tickets there. But Sunday completely sold out. Nice. Yeah. They yeah, didn't they didn't have that backstop where the Jonas brothers were on Sunday? No. No, the oh, pyro shit, I didn't there. even oh jeez. Maybe I should yeah, they had a, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> a bunch of sections were like blocked off and they put, sort of put the top on over it. But uh yeah, seventy thousand three hundred and twenty eight the first game, seventy nine thousand six hundred and ninety the second game. So like you said, with over hundred and fifty thousand hockey fans. So Great weekend. Go ahead, Biz. I, I don't know what the viewership was, but doing these types of things after football's done, I know I know this might sound contradictory to my start doing all games <laughs> on Sundays and, and go head to head. I might, hey, I, much like uh, or unlike Pasha, I might be t willing to take the L on this one. But doing it after that, and as far as Winter Classics and Skirt, like, could you bump that back even a little bit farther? Maybe do more I that are done after. I think that's all about all about like New Year's Day, right? I mean, I don't know. Okay. Like, but. Do, wait, do you think college football is like stagnant popularity wise, or, or dipping, or going up? Because I mean, I don't know. It feels like I, there's just I too feel many like games college now. football is going up, but then all I do is kind of read people bitching about the transfer portal, and I think there's a lot of aspects of college football that piss people off. But I don't know. The 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 entertainment factor might be better for college football than the NFL, right? Like, there's just. There's, it just seems like so many NFL games end up being kind of shitty where college football, obviously there's the blowouts with the top dogs play the little guys, but I don't know. That's a great question. I, I, I do love the fact, though. I love that next year we'll be going to um, Columbus for, for Detroit and Columbus oh. at, at, at Ohio State Stadium. What's that yeah. place called? Oh, I the think horseshoe? it's Ohio, Ohio Stadium. Stadium. Yeah, oh, the, the horseshoe, U? though. It's, everyone knows the it U? is the horseshoe. That, that will be awesome unreal that's the perfect area you know the, the rivalry of michigan and ohio that's going to be great that was an awesome announcement to see so I, I i love it you know like people kind of bitch about the outdoor games you said it already but i don't know man it's just it's 82 games it's a little different it's something else to watch looks a little different on tv i i great for the fans there i don't see what what the complaints are about it like you're okay so you're watching um devil's flyers at the flyers arena or devil's arena instead like why wouldn't you want to watch it the way we did Exactly. It's an event. And if you're there, it's fucking awesome. And it's speaking awesome. of the devils, boys, I, 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 idiot boy Pasha told me that over the All-Star break, I guess Lindy Ruff, he changed their defensive structure a little bit, like try to help out the goaltending and, and try to figure out a way to get this team somehow in the playoff race. Well, they're in the race, but back on track in terms of last year, the way they played. Buddy, they look pretty good. They're giving up less chances and giving up way less goals, too. I know Dawes is playing awesome. They kind of found, obviously found him, and he's going right now. But 
all these Devils fans who hate Lindy Ruff, it seems like he did a legit thing, a nice little move, changing the structure and getting them to be better defensively because they look like a different team. We got to talk about the fucking Sopranos uniforms. I know it's, it's uh, the off ice. They definitely won the game and they oh, won yeah. the, uh, the off ice. They look so fuck. They did look like a bunch of dudes from the North End with that were going to come over the bridge and jack me up for not paying my tab or something. They looked uh, unbelievable with those get ups on. Yeah, and, and and Bastion, he like he hasn't scored much, and he still had the. I think he said after I already prepared. If I scored the, uh, the is it Tommy DeVito? Yeah, like yeah. that was perfect. Yeah. And he kind of skated by a teammate who went to hug him. But that that's a good reason to do that. You know, you get the hand out of the glove. The old Italian. I don't even know what that. What does that mean? Like, uh, I just like that. forget like about Italians it. Talk, Italians yeah, talk yeah. about the hands. Like, kid, what are you fucking public you pressure? Crazy kid, kid, I skeeve that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now Devils. Hey, five they should points get back. these on the shoulder patches. <laughs> hey, the fighting Italian, they, they get the the uh, on the shoulder yeah. patches. Plus, they fucking did jerseys. I think they were the best of the four all weekend. But uh, oh right yeah, now, the Devils, Devils jerseys off. were fucking ten out of ten. Sweet, five points back of the wild card right now. They do have two games in hand. Uh, Flyers third in the Metro at sixty five points. Flyers also named uh, Sean Couturier the twentieth captain in team history. Uh, but wait, I want to go back to you and. Jack Hughes, the, the quote was going around about goalies. Gee, why don't you run that for us? I don't know. I mean, uh, Dawsey played really well. So when you get the saves, uh, much easier to win. So uh, great game out of him. Did, was he getting too much heat for this? Was he really chirping his goalies or just answered a question? Okay, so the way you guys told me this at dinner on Wednesday night before the Chicklets cast or whatever it was, Tuesday night, and, and, and it was worded different to me because right away I was like, what? He said that? And then once I watched the clip, it was, it was definitely different than how it was described to me. Still, I, I, there is some sort of sense of like, yeah, like, you know, w w when we get saves, we can win. It's a, it's a very obvious fact. And I'm sure there's been a ton of frustration within the Devils this year. Like, it does suck, man, when you're playing what you think is pretty decent hockey. And then it seems like every time you need a save, you can't get one. It's been their whole season. I think it's been openly, publicly discussed that the Devils have zero goaltending. And it switched a little bit with Dawes lately. But I said right away, like, I just don't think you'd ever hear, like, Crosby or, or uh, Taves when he was playing and and McKinnon, like, kind of throwing a, a goalie under the bus that way. I don't think he did. Once you heard it, it was a lot more innocent than whoever told me made it sound. But it's, it definitely was a little noticeable. Now, here's the thing. It's the truth. He said a yeah. flat-out fact. Like, well, yeah, when we get saves, it's, we're going to win some games. So it was the, I, I, I kind of overreacted at dinner because what I was told sounded way different than how it actually sounded. And then after uh, that was right on the ice. And then after the game, I think he went into it even more in depth and made it sound a lot more normal. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, we need everyone to step it up. The goalie's got to play well. We all got to do our job. But in terms of like calling out your goaltender publicly, I don't really I can't think of an example of anyone ever doing that. Biz. I'm not saying he did, but do you know what I mean? No, yeah, like when, when we read out the quote that was just on the internet, it, it didn't sound great. But once we kind of realized the whole context of it, it wasn't that bad. And it also might have been a little bit more amplified because uh, I don't know if it was the same game where he, or maybe the next one where he was barking at the guy in the box, basically. Like Arvidsson. People, it was Arvidsson, yeah. He's yeah. Like, people pay to watch me play where it's like, well, <laughs> no lies detected. <laughs> Crosby and Taylor no, say that either. Yeah, they weren't coming to watch me. I know that. <laughs> You know, knuckle <laughs> drag it around and give the fucking linesman water bottles during the timeouts and, and then clean up the snow between the, <laughs> where the where the door is. No, but uh, buddy, like he, he's balancing it fine. Like it's it's been a frustrating season for them. And like really as a group, they're real big first bout of adversity with expectations being where they're at. And we're going back to what you're saying, like the defensive zone structure and the fact that there might be help on the way. The thing that needs to happen is if this group, once they get healthy and they have all their guys going, if they can look down the room and look at a guy like Markstrom in their net and the amount of respect that they would have for a Markey's not just a goalie. He's a leader in the locker room. He's a man of presence where when you look at him, like he commands respect. That's what I think they need. I don't know if they're going to end up getting them, but if they get that and they can package it with Tanev, once they kind of get their mojo back and everybody healthy, <laughs> That like the we the the East is not that strong. That to me would be a very scary matchup. They they to me with with that if they make up that Markstrom trade outside of Florida, they're my second team is I that I would love the most. What? No. Wow, buddy. What about the they, Leafs, dude. You said another the one. Leafs the boys. What do you mean? I'm 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 <laughs> proud. I'm pr no, but I'm saying I'm saying from a realistic perspective with all of the pieces, with all of the pieces. 
I think that the, what the Leafs are doing right now is incredible without Morgan Riley. I fucking love the way they're playing. I love. Are they relying heavily on their stars? Are they getting a little that McMahon kid? That's fun to watch. Let's not hop into them quite yet. I was just trying to give praise to the Devils and what what they can kind of pull out of their ass, given the fact up until right now this year's been hell. Yeah, and I wonder what actually broke down that Markstrom deal. Apparently, it was that close, and then at the end, boom, talks are off. So you wonder, like, was it retention money? Like, who knows? A prospect thrown in. That's when you just love to be inside, be a be a fly on the wall, and hear like, oh my god, if they were that close, like, what changed it? But what what really sucks is since then the the Flames are shit, and we've always talked. Markstrom like hates hearing this stuff. He doesn't want to hear any of it. And they went to him, and he agreed to, that he would go to Jersey, and boom, it falls apart. And now the team struggled. And Marky, who's had a great year, he struggled a little bit. So it's it kind of was a kick in the dick for both teams, right? But. Yeah, if, if the Devils could get a legit stud goalie, a little help on D. The other thing is if they get in the playoffs, all of a sudden you got Hamilton back. So I, I don't know. I, don't, I agree, Biz. Like, you don't want to play them in the first round. But if they get in and then they're the eighth seed and then it looks like uh, I think it's I think Florida is going to end up getting the number one seed. Obviously, the Rangers are above them right now. But Florida is Florida's a cool. different animal. They are they are just bullies with skill and goaltending and they got great D. It's just it's an incredible team. So I don't know if anyone's going to be able to get by them, let alone the first, let, let alone the entire Eastern Conference. But the first round might be real tough, whoever gets them. But I would like to see Jersey in personally. I think they're an exciting team. I love watching Hughes play. He sheer showed up big time in that game. Man, that guy was flying around. He's the leader of the team. That's what Pasha said when we were talking about the Hughes thing. He's like, oh, well, well first off, he... Pasha thought that he called out the goalies publicly because he'd already gone to Fitzgerald and complained about the goal thing, and he was trying to put more public <laughs> pressure on the GM. I said, Pasha, you're fucking insane. Yep. And he's sticking to his gun standard to how Pasha does things. But it is a fun team to watch. It is very <laughs> this, fun to watch. This, all those things you just heard out of Witt's mouth are factors in the decision to suspend him for the pod, by the way. <laughs> all of that stuff behind the scenes, if you're wondering. <laughs> Uh, oh, one other thing that was pretty cool. Uh, Jake Clemens, he played the national anthem on a saxophone. Uh, his dad was the the big man, and uh, Bruce Springsteen, the E Street Band, Clarence Clemens, you know, the big black guy who played the saxophone, passed away a few years ago. That was his son who, who came out and played the sax, you know, the national anthem. That was that was awesome stuff. Incredible! It was an incredible that. anthem. Ten out of ten. Yeah, it was good shit. Also, and we also because we bumped into uh, Jonesy Rupper and uh, Kenny Danico too before we headed into that first game. Nice to catch up with those guys. Dude, so Jonesy's good. fucking hilarious. Like, oh, he just comes over. He's like, what's up, Ari? What's going on? Like, he's just like, it's like almost like not a joke to him, but he's just like fucking get a smile on his face, the shitty grin that he's the president. He's just like, no like, bad days for Jonesy, man. Uh, he's he's, he's always guy. happy. He's always got a smile on his face. Great, great couple of great guys to, to bump, in, bump into. But the most favorite part of my weekend is after Lou tried to suck the fun out of it, they go up three fucking goals and they blow it again. Before we get into that game, one of the one of the most enjoyable games this year, I guess because of the setting, but then just how it all went down. But let's talk about Matthew Rempe, guys. What a first NHL game. First off, he gets to do the, the rookie lap in front of 75,000. His first game, that's incredible, right? You're skating around. Nobody's behind you, and you're just looking around. I can't imagine how he was feeling. And then his first game, first shift, he gets in a tilt. One second played, and he already had a fight in the NHL. Matt Martin, he's a monster. Uh, just a big guy came up, and what was really cool, uh, Ra, you 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 told me that it was six days, six years to the day of his father passing away. Mm -hmm. So, yep. like, I don't know, maybe like right now I'm visiting my parents. It's like the kid was 15 years old and lost his dad, and he gets out there, he gets the hat for player of the game. After gave an awesome little speech in the locker room. You know, I can't imagine how tough it w was for him losing his dad at such a young age. And then he's out there in the NHL at MetLife Stadium. He's getting in a fight. Like, that was such a cool story. Like, that's what hockey's all about, right? You know, you bring back, like, memories of this kid skating outside as a youngster. That's his first game. And then getting the player of the game after, like, I think Kreider gave it to him because he had a hat trick the game before. And you could tell the team was so fired up. It was just an awesome story to see that kid. And what a monster. And then they had oh, the man. other wing on that fourth line, 6-7. Who's the other kid? Uh, I, I, I don't know his I'll name. He's another he monster. So <laughs> remember yeah, two name. six foot seven guys on the Rangers. And hey, we yeah. got to give a, a shout out to Matt Martin too, because uh, Adam Rempe Estro, said that, Adam Estro, Estro, I believe is his name. Yeah, Rempe said that you know, like at the you know, the lineup for the faceoff, Martin said, hey, you know, you want to go? I like, gave him the opportunity to sort of make his bones there, and he really respected that. Just you know, because that's obviously something you used to 
you know, be, be your forte, that type of stuff. Or just the fact that oh, Matt yeah, Matt to be given that old. that oppor- to be given that yeah. opportunity from a guy like Matt Martin, who's that respected, and that's like a a cool thing to be able to tell your kids someday. That that was my first NHL fight off of a, off off a draw, right? Hadn't even barely played a second. I ended up running into his uh, mother and two sisters who were up there, and like the mother was just over the moon electric. <laughs> And she's like, I'm like, oh, my God, you must be so nervous. Like the rookie lap and then the fight. She goes, I normally don't drink. This is my third. And, <laughs> and so they were just having a ball up there. All right, Steve, too. From her. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> it's Adam and Strum. Ed Strum. Sorry. Bro. Yeah. No so just an, an aw- aw- awesome experience. And for them to come and storm back in that game, oh, what an incredible experience. And like I said, man, the amount of Rangers fans and how that building would erupt – and they're ruthless. They were interviewing, uh, was it Palmieri on the Jumbotron? G? And then they just they just kept booing. You couldn't even like you couldn't even hear hear what he was saying. You couldn't, you couldn't hear a single thing. It was insane. <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's like some real fucking hate. So that was my first ever real experience between the Rangers and Islanders rivalry. And it, it's uh it's pretty gruesome. So hey, and I made it out of uh, alive and I didn't get shanked. So I was very proud of myself. How about the fact that they hadn't played since 2022, those two teams? That Really? Yeah, because they played their four games before January 1st of the 22-23 oh, season. Okay. And then January. this year's season, they didn't play till they didn't play till the calendar changed again. So it had been like wow. 480 days or whatever since the Isles and Rangers played, and they gave us one of the best games of the season. I mean, the Islanders, man. Their penalty kill is a disaster. The same way the power play for the Penguins might keep them out of the playoffs, the Islanders, they can't they can't kill a penalty. So you look to what's going to cost them. I saw a tweet. I think they've blown like 12 or 13 third-period leads this yeah. season. It just seems like they can't close the door. I don't know what you guys thought about that hooking call um, that gave them their first power play. It was at the end of the third. Was that on ba- Barzell? Baz- Baz- yeah, Barzell on, on Keandre Mill. Because I, I was like, I tweeted out, yikes, and everyone was like, Oh, you don't know nothing about hockey. That's a penalty all day. I was like, what are you talking about? Dude? That was chintzy as fuck, dude. Everyone on Twitter was like, oh, that was a penalty. I was like, fucking soft ass little pussies. No, it wasn't. Oh, you, know what yeah, I took away from, you know what I took away from the third period? At one point, I looked up. I think shots were 40 to 19 Islanders. And Biz, you said a couple episodes ago, since Was come in there, the Islanders are getting 35, 40 shots a game. It's a, yeah, it's a different team. So they're dominating that game. Yeah, they, got, they got two three-goal leads, whatever it was. But the third period with the Rangers on the power play, I think they had like 10 or 11 power shots on the power play. But just a reminder, as a defenseman, a guy who leaned a little offense on the defenseman side, Adam Fox is a joy to watch play hockey. Oh, yeah, he's nasty. I mean, the assist on the tying goal, like he just has... I, I've never seen a guy just like fake people out with just little shoulder and head fakes the way he does. He's not. He's never moving that fast. It's like a little little sleight of hand, little head look. The one way he drops a shoulder and guys go like flying by him. It's he crazy. always has he always knows what he's gonna do with it before he gets it. I love I love watching him play. He's like the funnest guy to watch have the puck. And just the fact that he's like slow, I'll say he's kind of slow, but it doesn't affect him at all because his angles defensively are awesome. And then with the puck, there is zero panic. Like the guy never, it seems like he has no pulse with it. And then he makes dishes all the time that are sick. Gross. Wait, it's so funny you brought that up. First period, we were sitting like right in the corner. And he, he got a puck dumped in his corner and he had a guy on his ass and he dodged him. But then he was going up the wall side. And there was a guy coming down the wall and I'm like, ah, he's probably just going to try to punt this. And there's no way that he can squeeze through the like get to the middle. And he just brought it right to the middle and he dodged both guys. And I'm like, that was like, what the fuck was that? He's so slippery. He's so good on his edges. And, and he kind of has this little hop about him, but he's not the... It's like, I don't know, man. He's just kind of cracked the code on the back end for not being a guy who's that electrically fast. And I don't think that what he does is that teachable. Do you know what I mean? No, it's, no, it's, it's no, super no, no, just no. like, like you're not going to be able to like show kids clips of him and be like, yeah, do this because it's just so natural the way he does things. I guess at Harvard, uh, talking to different scouts, he was the same thing, probably even more dominant in college. But a lot of scouts were like, I don't know, man, like he's not that fast. And like, yeah, this is college. And he's, 
doing the exact same thing in the NHL. It's like the foot speed thing doesn't really matter when you have that ability to just make these fakes all the time. And it, it's just, I don't I don't know, maybe I, I just appreciate it more being a defenseman and realizing how hard it is to always get shots through and just always dodge that one check. But that guy is so nasty with the puck. It, it's, it's Sergei Zubov. He's Sergei Zubov. So I think he leads the league and, oh, I think they got him. Oh, how the fuck did he slip out of that one? Like every fucking time. So, yeah, he's a treat to watch. That's a great point. Yeah, it was also the highest scoring outdoor game ever with the 11 goals. Uh, also, what just you just mentioned they hadn't played in that long a time. It was the first fight in a regular season Rangers Islanders game since November of 2021. That's kind of pathetic when you think about it. That yeah. long without a fight between those two fucking hated rivals. I mean, obviously, it's indicative of the way the league is now, but that kind of surprised me a wee bit, no? I mean, fucking two and yeah. a half years without a scrap. Uh, also, too, uh, we want to send our, our best wishes along to Blake Wheel. The the reason Rempe was called up is Blake Wheel. I don't know if you saw the, the clip. It was tough to watch. He you know, hurt, hurt his lower leg. He's going to be out for the rest of the season. You know, he's obviously oh. on the back down of his career. So hopefully he can get back out there and not end his, his career like that. I'm, I'm sure being a hockey player, that's not how he's going to go out. So I uh, just want to pass our best wishes along to him. And also the Rangers, you know, they come out with the FDNY, NYPD guys. And I think the Isles, they are, they are getting shit for coming with the suits, but it, it should be noted. They also came in with a bunch of cops and firemen as well. They came in on the truck. So I think a lot of people might have didn't weren't aware of that or whatever because they were getting shit on because of the suits. But, you know, they were with the cops and the Jakes, too. So I just want to make sure people are aware of that. So I know way, we were just nice. being a little silly. I think he probably did that not to overshadow the, the, the you know, the men and women of service. So Absolutely, that's why. Yeah. Yeah. Lou being, Lou, Lou being classy. Maybe we should back off him a little bit, especially after that tough. <laughs> Tough third yeah, period loss it, again. Yeah, that's the name. Saquon Barkley, the Giants uh, running back. He, he was at the game. Tweet out, hockey games are really lit. It's nice to see, you know, people getting into the game as well. We mentioned Johnny Laz, but uh, also you just mentioned with the outdoor game next year in Columbus. Also, Islanders are going to host the 2026 All-Star game at UBS Arena. Uh, the Devils <laughs> and Sabres. Huh, I was pissed at first, but then I was talking to my buddy Jeff, and he goes, they might have done that just to keep it logistically easy because they're going to be going to the Olympics right after that. So to agree them for them to come to go from New York to fly to it's in Italy, right? 2026. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I thought that was smart, but a lot of people online and they're right. Detroit deserves an all-star game because they, they often reward them to new buildings of the new buildings built. Little Caesars arena is easily the nicest. That brick wall and the character and how nice all the seats are, the the vibe in that arena, I think they deserve, after UBS, they deserve the next All-Star game. Unless yeah, it's outdoors it, like Grin Grinelli suggested. Uh, also, I, this is not new news, but the Devils and Sabres, they got to kick off next season in Prague. I, I don't know if Merle's at uh, Pasha are going to go there. They're saying they're going to. Uh, then in November, the Stars and Panthers, they're going to play in, uh, t is it Tampere, Finland? Is that how you pronounce it with? Tampere? I have no idea. I've never no been. Idea. But okay. how about Gr Grinelli sends me a video. So Merles has been stateside for what, like 28 days? <laughs> Too long. His today. wife's an absolute saint. He's got two <laughs> little kids at home. So he's leaving today. He has a flight at five o'clock. And, and it's like, he, he. I think it's like 16 hours of travel. When he lands in Stockholm, it's like a four hour train up north in Sweden. So he always talks about last night he has to take it easy. Because the travel day, you got you can't be hung over going to the travel day. Grinelli sends, <laughs> sends me a video at like eight o'clock of a bartender pouring these monster vodka drinks. And then he just pans over to Merle's and he's like, tonight's the night. I'm like, oh my God, dude. <laughs> every, yeah. hey, every night this trip, every night this trip, Merle's would just say, Tonight's the night, boys. <laughs> tonight's the night. So I texted, uh, I texted him, I said, Oh my God, Merles, you must be hurting. And he responded about five hours later. He goes, I'll never learn. <laughs> <laughs> how about uh how about last night I had a date and I brought uh, a Grinnell, I brought uh a Memesy, and I brought Merles. So we you did like a these four three guys to a date. <laughs> <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> my God. What was the date, Paul? Date. We went to this unbelievable Italian restaurant that Grand uh, Vin, found. great spot. And that and and that's where I think Merles went off the deep end. He started to get into the red wine, and he gets a certain vibe when he's having his red wine. All the respect in the world to this young lady who put up with us for for the whole meal. But memes, he was firing out the story. She even today, she was like, "Oh, those guys were fucking characters." She loved. Did you it. guys see memes' Instagram story at like one a.m. last night of him no, just pissing it off? Now? 
he just it was just him pissing off the end of the pier in Hoboken on the Chicklets oh. memes account. Oh. Come on, come on, memes, clean it up. He's buddy. like, oh, this water's <laughs> cold. Come on, clean it up. <laughs> uh shit. Well, I I did just mention that Tampa, Finland. One of the native sons, probably the biggest story of the week. Uh, Yamo Kikalainen was fired from Columbus. He was there for 11 years, the first European-born GM in the NHL. Uh, president of Hockey Ops, John Davidson, he's going to assume the GM role on an interim basis. He's going to oversee the transition when they hire the next GM. Uh, Biz, were you surprised that Yamo was the only guy who got fired considering what you know what went down earlier this season? And just has been kind of a, a clusterfuck of a year for them. Because uh, I, I don't know how much the beginning of the year played a factor into it i would imagine it's you know a, a pro- what do you what do you mean you think they just wanted to let it breathe but i i also don't think it's a hundred percent reason why i mean look at how I, long i think he's when you've a- had a gm who's kind of they've struggled for quite a while that's what i'm hire, saying then you hire a coach and then the guy doesn't coach one game like <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm saying but okay so do you think that that plays 25 to 35 percent of a factor as to why he's not the gm if this team was having more success and maybe in a playoff hunt we wouldn't be having this conversation but how long was he a 10-year gm i would say close to 10 years 11 years he was there 11 and years how, how many times did they go to playoffs like where are they at from an organizational organizational perspective and, and and also maybe the 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 lack of production over the last couple of years given the high draft picks they're not seeing results but what do you? What percentage do you think it has to do with what happened at the beginning of the year in hiring Babcock? Fifty um, percent of it? it may, I don't know. That's hard. Like maybe half, maybe a little less. Obviously, it comes down to the success of the team. So Ra said five playoff appearances in eleven years, and one time they got past the first round. Right, Ra? Yeah, they won the. They beat Tampa that year. Then they did win that qualifying round during the bubble thing. You know, they, that doesn't count. That doesn't exactly. count. Okay, just put um, it out there. Yeah. So. It's just, it's, first off, I couldn't believe it was 11 years he'd been there, right? That was a long time. But you know what? Like, in the end, they haven't had success. They've had some, they've had just some, like, maybe some weird signings and, like, I don't know. But it, all, all in all, man, if you're, if you want to be a GM, like, that's a, that's a pretty nice spot to be able to interview for and possibly get, like, with Fantilli and and Juracek and like some other young guys, they got all these Russians that are good. They got China Cobb, all these different dudes that are pretty nice young players. I think a decent amount of them have to be signed after this year or next year. But man, I I, I do think the future's bright in Columbus. I know this year's been a disaster and they it, it started off on the wrong foot completely. But I think in the, in the end, in a couple of years, you're gonna be able to see a really good team. Now. Obviously, they need a little bit more to Goudreau, who's played way better like lately as opposed to the beginning of the season. But in the end, Biz, I, I think that that was kind of the nail in the coffin, man. If you're going to go out on the limb and make this huge hire and the guy doesn't get to one game, like that's going to end up being the end of it. And But but at the same time, all right, like why is Davidson still have a job? Yeah. That's, well, that's right? how, long is, how long has he been there? He's probably I feel like been he's there. been there forever. No, no he was, he was there. there for, he went to New York. He, yeah, he left. He went to the Rangers, and then they brought him back. And that's what it is. Oh. It seems like oh, owners fall in love with, like certain owners fall in love with certain executives because, you know, he came back. He's been there, I think, the last three or four years. But, I mean, Yamo didn't make that hiring decision in a vacuum. He didn't do that by himself. You know what I mean? Like, so I don't, I don't know if the owners just love Davidson. I mean, that, that doesn't, I would say, have a, dynamite track record as far as getting victories there and i think some of that probably does fall on him well i think that he's also partly there to consult on who he believes should be the next gm now i don't know how how much his hands in the cookie jar as far as personnel decisions i would assume that he had a lot of influence influence on the babcock one and that's where maybe you're surprised as to why he still has the job i don't know i think like i said i don't want to put too much stake onto the babcock thing i think like Bringing in Patrick Laine hasn't necessarily worked out, but I also understand the pressures and being a GM there and trying to bring in big names. It's a challenge, but I also think that you have to GM based on where you are. And I feel like you're, you're kind of like a Seattle. You have to build out this roster of just worker bees. You're not going to have the luxury of bringing in these big name free agents because you're in Columbus. And like, I'm not shitting on Columbus. I would love to live there. The players who play there love it there. You live like a god. I mean, there's a reason that Johnny Goudreau went there. It's like, you know, maybe when things aren't going so well, you don't have that external pressure where when you're bumping to people at the grocery store, they're saying, hey, how you doing? Maybe they don't even ask you for a photo. 
but they ain't fucking telling you, hey, what's up with the fucking power play, Johnny? Come yeah, on, man. Got to start I, hitting line A back door, buddy. I, I think that those fans deserve more, though. That is an unreal they fan do. base. Unreal. Man, they, they've been packing Loyal. that building for, for years, dude. Yeah. And here's the other thing. Like, it hasn't just been Babcock. This season was a disaster in a lot of different aspects, right? So we've had Merzlikin saying, I'm done. I want to trade. We've had Juracek saying, I, like, I shouldn't be in the minors. What the fuck's going on? The coaches benching Goudreau. Like, it's been like a bunch of different things that have kind of added up to just you know, a full-blown disaster of a season. Now, the good thing is they probably end up with another high draft pick. Hopefully, they, they make the right decision and they get another guy. But, Biz, you're right. It's First off, the whole league, you, to have a successful team, you got to build through the draft. But there, there especially, you don't, you don't see a ton of guys signing there. I know Goudreau did recently, but you got to have good drafts. you got to build from within. So that's what they're going to have to do. But in terms of the future, the fan base is great. The arena is awesome. It's a good city. Grinelli says top three in the in the world, I think he said. Yeah. Paris, <laughs> Milan, Columbus. It is. Yeah, that's, it why is. They dra- that's why they drafted all those Russians. It's like Moscow. It's like the same thing, right? Like that, that's, the, that's the draw in there. And, and Witt, I'll say this. I think the number one component to it all is Fantilli and the fact that they have buy-in from him in that market right now. So Davidson, you got about you know, two, three years before certain guys will get fed up with, okay, I'm not going to be in a big market. We can't turn things around. I fucking put my heart and soul into this. Like how long did it take to, for them to try to get it together for Rick Nash? Yeah. I mean, 20, like 23 that, did, seasons. Oh, sorry. Did they me. ever, did they ever really get it together for Rick Nash? How many times did he make playoffs? One time? Like he's a generational talent that went to waste and, yeah, I don't know. That's it's it's well after this year it'll be twenty three seasons one playoff victory uh, over Tampa Cup. Yes, well, that's just okay. That's just pathetic. You do feel bad for the fans, and that's what, going back to like well, Davidson. I thought uh, if I was the owner, I would have done a full house cleaning. Look, this, the, we got to get the stick out of here. Just fucking not fight everybody, but you know, bring in a whole new management team and just start fresh. I think that's what they probably. Uh, should I have I, did, I think that Davidson's been around enough to where um, you probably want to give him an opportunity. To, to consult on who you got to bring in. That's just, my, I think he's the type of guy who's been around enough who, who needs a seat. You need him with a seat at the table to, to say, these are the candidates I believe could potentially get it. Who else yeah, are you well, going to turn? Who well, else? He, did, you he did with Babcock. I mean, you know, he, he was all about getting Babcock and that fell in its face. And then I think I'm that sure. he felt they needed another torts and that's how that was going to happen. And he, he, he ain't exactly torts. He, he has different uh, different ways of doing it, and they made a wrong decision. And I don't disagree with you, R.A., that, that if you're saying throw – what do they say? Throw the something away with the bathwater? Uh, oh. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Oh, but in this case, they should have. Okay. Hey, uh, not to change the subject, but as I um, was giving it to Pasha that – Miller had a hat trick and that Vancouver was oh. up 5-2. to two. Wow. They were also up 4-1. to one. The Wild just scored five goals in the first five <gasps> minutes of the third period, including three goals in a minute, and they're up eight to five. The Wild Six are buzzing. Six goals in a row, too. Wait, but uh, but wait. Since then, Pasha has come on the show Double and five. said that the city of Vancouver should thank him. So in retrospect, Pasha jinxed the Canucks today. Oh, no. Oh, no. Good point. Uh, yeah, Biz, before we move along, one last one on Columbus side. Uh, Johnny Gaudreau, he did a pretty good thing. He took over uh, Patrick Liney's pledge of $1,000 per point while Lane, Lane steps away from the game to take care of his mental health. Pretty nice gesture, man. You know what I mean? The guys do that for their charity. So I thought it was pretty cool that Johnny took over from uh, Patrick for that. So good job, Johnny. Boys, I, maybe it was, I don't know, it was me in the locker room that rubbed off on Austin Matthews, but two hats <laughs> Gaudreau, he's been on <laughs> sound like Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, and Pasha two, now. Second straight. Well, he had two hat, hat tricks in a row. Sixth of the season. A, a new Maple Leafs record. He's got 49 goals. He had one today on Monday. 73rd multi-goal game. A team record. Got 13 career hat. He's tied with Sid and Gino uh, for third among active players. Ovi's got 30. Pasta's got 16. Of course, Wayne, the all-time leader with 50. Uh, 10 is the most in one season. Wayne did that twice. Got a good chance to catch him. Getting the MVP chance. Biz, you must be fucking creaming your jeans over there, eh? But I don't care who you are. I don't care if you hate or despise the Toronto Maple Leafs. He has to be a consideration for top three in MVPs right now. I think you're out of your fucking mind if you don't think so. We're witnessing the greatest goal scorer ever since Wayne Gretzky, right? Like at well, the rate. 
it, it it's tracking that way. I don't think it's fair to say with Ovi, but but it's tracking that way, Biz. And and when you said the greatest leaf of all time, the gloat, like a couple of years ago, I was laughing. It's it's pretty much over now. Like it, Bro, by the end of next season, he will be the all time Leafs leading goal scorer at like twenty seven years old. It's fucking insane. Wild. He's already the gloat. The fact that he's got six Hatties this year, <laughs> it's it's an if you score 70 goals in today's NHL with where defenses are at, with the way that goaltending is is at, and the fact that you're not getting these fucking easy goals coming over the blue line, sliding at five hole, it's remarkable what he's doing. He is a, sco- a scoring machine, and people will say, oh, that's offensive too because Ovechkin scored as many as he has, but Matthew, since he's been in the league, is doing it at a better rate. He's the best modern-day goal scorer. It's like non-negotiable here. Any analytic will tell you that. So to not consider him top three in MVP voting right now is insane. If it's not for him, I don't think the Toronto Maple Leafs are inside of a playoff spot. But wit, they just won again today. I think he had a goal. Which what's he at now? Which, which is number forty-nine 40, goals in forty-nine goals. Games. <laughs> Insanity. I said that they were going to win four games of the five that Morgan Riley was suspended. So now he's won four. We made a bet, did we not? Is that three or four? That's four. Oh, that's so four. They already now. did it. So I owe you some money, buddy. That was a great call by you. That was a great call by you. And and so, on it on like the way he gets his shot off. Like I, I just, first off, it definitely helps him, and uh, it goes without saying. He's a, he's enormous, right? Like he's his reach is so big that. He's able to just, like, you think you got to stick on him. He just pushes that, that extra two inches. And then his shot, he just picks corners. And it doesn't matter, too. You see how many times the puck's rolling and he still just rips it, which probably helps. The goalie has no idea where it's going. But, yeah, he, he I wonder if you talk to Bucci, who originally, like, 12 years ago said Ovi could break uh, Gretzky's record. Like, I wonder what he's saying now. Because, uh, Matt, like, yeah, you said it. He's on a better pace than Ovi was. He never seems to slow down. And as crazy as this Kucherov season is, and what an MVP race it's going to be, these final 30 games, but if he gets 70, which I don't think the league's had, what, 30 years, 31 years? Yeah, give him the MVP, no doubt. Because it, it it's just, it's unreal. Like, you know, he goes about his business, and he's better defensively than people give him credit for. And if the puck's on his stick, it doesn't really matter where he is in the offensive zone. He's a chance to score. we have I remember this year in Buffalo, he scored from the goal line against the board. It's like, he's just such a good shooter. Doesn't even really need to be looking at the net. And boom, it's in the back of the net. Red lights it on. It's he crazy. He knows where it is. And even around the net, if it's around the blue paint, he doesn't need to have a big windup. He's able to just find a way to get a stick on it, and it just pops off his stick and goes in the net. He's just, he's a fucking specimen. And he's cracked the code. And he's the best modern-day goal scorer. And right now, he looks like he's going to win the MVP. And he's going to get, he might get 75 fucking goals this year. <laughs> and and by the way, like, so 29 games left, whatever he has, like, he's getting another hat trick, at least. <laughs> like, once the he most- gets- once the he most gets in two, one it's season. just a matter of time. Wasn't the most in one season? Wayne Gretzky had 10 hat-tricks in one season? He did it, yeah, he did it twice. Oh, my then God. I said it twice. Okay. Well, there we go. And, and, and you know what? You got to shout out McMahon, too. I think they're calling him Mick Matthews. He's lighting it up. He had a hat-trick in between one of Matthews or two of his, and then he got another one today as well. So that's a guy stepping it up. That's a, a diamond in the rough, just what the Leafs needed at this time. A diamond in the rough. Well, speaking of Canadian legends, we have one right now for you. Uh, Peter Mansbridge, for our American listeners, you're probably not familiar with him. He's basically the Walter Cronkite of Canada, one of the most respected and well-liked uh, media guys up in Canada. He's been retired for a few years now. A uh, very interesting conversation. This guy's traveled the world, covered some of the biggest stories ever. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy it. We certainly enjoyed uh, interviewing him. So enjoy Peter Mansbridge. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at Game Time. Uh, Bruins Monday afternoon versus Dallas. Jumped on the old game time app. Took care of my boys. Unbelievable. Dynamite app to use. You get last minute tickets. There's flash deals, zone deals. It's so easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. Concerts, music, comedy, and of course, sports. Take a look at the app right now. Boston Celtics. Boom. Best team in the NBA. Game time. Hooks it up big time. PWHL. You want to go see the pro women up in Lowell? Boom. You got that too. UMass basketball, all kinds of stuff, no matter where you are. 
And that's not even including concerts or what kind of comedians might come to town. Again, it's so easy to buy tickets, find tickets for every event that's out there. And GameTime is obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. GameTime has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event. And even an hour after it starts, it's the place to find last-minute seats. Find exclusive flash deals and sponsored deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and a whole bunch more. With zone deals, you pick the section and Game Time picks the seats for an average of 18% savings. And the Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Chicklets for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, Create an account and redeem code Chicklets for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome Canadian royalty to the show. <laughs> this newsman has been the face of Canadian media for decades and has covered some of the biggest stories in the last 50 plus years. And though he retired a few years ago, you can still check him out on his podcast, The Bridge. Thank you so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Peter Mansbridge. It's an honor to have you here, Peter. Hey, it's an honor for me to be here. You guys are, uh, well, you're quite something. No <laughs> <devil's on. laughs> I don't know what quite it is. Any, but that was our <laughs> national news I'll broadcaster forever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, le I've learned a whole new vocabulary listening to you guys. No, no, no. What's your favorite? <laughs> Let's go through the list here. Uh, uh, Pink Whitney. Yeah, yeah that's okay. my favorite. There you go. Good answer. Good answer. Oh, gee, that's Good awesome. Answer. Well, Peter, like learning about your early career, it's, it's crazy. Like You said you were a high school dropout. You joined the Navy, and you were you're working at a small airline in I, um. What, Churchill, Alberta, was it? Churchill, Manitoba. Manitoba. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And yeah. and you, uh, someone overheard you doing a flight announcement and, and heard your voice and come over and offered you a job on the radio. That's Yeah, great. can you believe that? Oh, no, it's unbelievable. <laughs> I, try, I try to explain that to young journalism students and they look at me like, <laughs> I, you know, from another planet. But that is what happened. I mean, it was a different era. It was the 60s hmm. and people weren't rushing into journalism or broadcasting at that point. Uh, and I had this opportunity, uh, and it was one of those classics being in the right spot at the right time. But somebody heard me announcing, you know, a flight, Transair Flight 106 to Thompson, the Paw in Winnipeg, now ready for boarding, you know. <laughs> and and this, guy, this guy comes running over to the, to the microphone, and he says, you got a great voice. He says, I'm the manager of the station. I can't find anybody to do the late night shift. Would you be interested? I mean, this is Churchill, you know, population yeah. 1,000. Um, and that's how it started. And, uh, then, you know, one thing led to another, there was a bit of hard work involved as well. Oh yeah. Nevertheless, that's how, how it got started. So what, oh, go ahead. Wait. No, I was just at the beginning. So you get there, you don't know what's going on, right? You've never done anything like this. Nothing. Like I'm imagining the first few shows were a little rough, right? When you're kind of learning it. Yeah, they were, but in Churchill, you could get away with yeah. a little rough, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, I, you pick up a few tricks. I was terrible at music and that's what he'd hired me at, but I was always fascinated with news, what's going on around you and asking questions. And so I, I started a newscast. I didn't have one there. And, uh, that's how I started making a name for myself first in Churchill for a couple of years, then Winnipeg, Regina, Ottawa, Toronto, overseas. And so I did quite a bit of running around for 20 years yeah. as a reporter and correspondent. And then started anchoring. For, from the time he like offered you the job, like how much time did it take you to think about it in order to take it? Was it on the I, spot? I, was listen, you hesitant? I, I was making two hundred dollars a month at Transair, the airline I was working for. So it didn't take me too long to think about it. Um, and so I worked days at the airline for the first year and nights at the at the radio station. Uh, but I, I th something about me had always been fascinated by broadcasting, so I wanted to. I wanted to give it a try. I never thought it would lead to where it led, uh, which was basically the top job in news in the country. And uh, <laughs> which is it's exactly crazy. you laugh and go like, how'd that happen? Because you started where they send people to, like you were already there. Isn't it now like people get jobs and are like, hey, good job, you graduated from what's a school here? What's a, what everyone goes well, to it? I forget. They're like, you got Ryerson. a job. You got to go to you know York. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, in, in <laughs> those days it was a. Uh, you know, it, it was a fluke to get in, but at the same time, there weren't, as I said earlier, there wasn't a lineup of people. 
in there, but it was a great community to to, uh, to get a start in. There were lots of stories, you know, polar bears and all, <laughs> you know, all oh, the yeah. different uh, issues. There's a, a harbor there, a port, and ships coming in. There was great hockey. Jordan Tutu's father played there, and he was a great player. And people used to say, Barney, right? Barney. Barney. Was, yeah. he a machi- was he killing people too like Jordan did? Oh, he was tough. <laughs> he was a tough guy, but a great skater, a great goal scorer, had a terrific stick. And he, um, you know, people used to say, if anybody ever came up from the NHL and saw him, they'd get him in. Now, I don't know whether that's true, but because not that far south in, in, in around that time, you know, Bobby Clark and Reggie Leach were playing for the Flin Flon Bombers. So they were able to make a name for themselves. Barney just stayed in Churchill, but then then Jordan came along. So you said you had a fascination with news. Was there any point within the beginning of your career where you maybe hoped it would turn into like covering hockey? Or were you all set on being news? You know what I mean? Or were you, were you not even interested? He was in too biased. Players? He was ripping on the Leafs all the time. <laughs> I was. <laughs> I was, was you were a Jets jock was your team, the Jets? Although there was a time in, in, in Manitoba, the early Jets, the first yep. version of the Jets uh, with Bobby Hull there. And, uh, you know, I was worried by that first year. I was at the corner of Portage and Maine the day that they, they unveiled Bobby with the million-dollar check and everything. Can you imagine? It was a million dollars, yeah, I think, which is a billion years. back then, right? Exactly. You know, <laughs> you look at it now, you go, really? He <laughs> left for bucks. that? That's what Biz made, big deal. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, th- that first year, the WHA and the, what was it called, the AFCO or the ATCO? AFCO or Cup, yeah. Yeah. And um, I, I followed him in the playoffs. They were played Houston and then uh, New England in the old Boston Garden. And uh, I was doing a, like a mini documentary on his first year in the WHA. And, you know, and you guys know Bobby or knew Bobby, and he was a bit of a character. Yeah. <laughs> he would have fitted in real well on this, <laughs> on, on Spit and Jerklets. But uh, anyway, he, you know, we, we uh, got to know each other during that time, and I, sort of stayed in touch over the years. I saw him just a couple of years ago, not long before he passed away. And he still had that handshake that could crush your body. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, amazing. Quite the guy. He's got that picture, right? The picture of, of Bobby Hall when he's just shredded in the summer, like mm-hmm. bale and hay. Oh, yeah. Bale and hay before and Belleville. Before people worked out. Exactly. Yeah. That's what this guy looked like? Oh, yeah. that was, that's where he was at, was in Belleville, Ontario? Belleville, that's where they grew up, the Hulls. That's how they used to train back. You no, know, him and uh, and Dennis, who still does the circuit, right? Dennis. Oh yeah, I see him at a few events. <laughs> He's hilarious. Same jokes every time, yeah. but they're they are hilarious. <laughs> <I know. laughs> the way he delivers. Now we went right to when you got your off of your career um, at the airport. Did you play growing up? Were you a big hockey player? Well, you know, I came over from England. We were uh, immigrants. We lived in England and Malaya. I came over in the mid fifties, and the first time I went into a hockey arena i think i was carrying a you know a cut off cricket bat you know like i really didn't know what was going on but i eventually got into hockey and i loved it i wasn't very good but you know i used to hang out at sort of center ice waiting you know like colby did yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know waiting for the puck to come out and then i'd have a breakaway it was great oh you're like me you couldn't skate either <laughs> <laughs> but uh anyway i i was never able to take it uh, you know any further than that but it was you know it's always been it's always been fun. It's been a passion to to watch. And when, growing up in Ottawa, which is where I grew up, there was no um, there was no team at that point. It was the old Sens were long gone. The new Sens hadn't arrived. And I, um, yeah, you had to choose between. Basically, you had to choose between red and blue. You were either a Habs fan or you were a Leafs fan. All of my family were Habs fans. I picked the Leafs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Now I picked you a good decade. Yeah. 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 I picked yeah, a good 16. decade. You know, we haven't seen one since. <laughs> <laughs> those were the quite days. like those. <laughs> hey, those were the days. Where the <laughs> cup every year, and you know the Mahavlitches and Dickie Duff and uh, the whole gang. It was uh, it was fun, but it's it's been a long time. Mm-hmm. So I was glad to hear Biz the other day predicting a Vancouver Toronto. That was final. I think that was that was on today's podcast that just dropped, right? right. And I That's just right. think that all of a sudden they're going to ride Samson off. But I am a delusional Leafs fan, just like the rest of the Leafs. Yeah, I'm oh, yeah. So, totally. Yeah, no, yeah. We're, we're we're definitely delusional. But I'll tell you the one thing you got right about that: the numbers. If it was Toronto, Vancouver, and the final, do you think it would do twenty million? Oh yeah. 
I, I think oh, yeah. is that how many people are in Canada? You said forty million. I so, think I think yeah. you're over twenty, man. Like the whole yeah. country be yeah. watching. Oh yeah. Oh no, it, it would be something else, and it would probably go six or seven games. It would just be the place would be electric. Oh. And Rogers would ev give everyone raises and pay bumps, right? <laughs> yeah. They don't have a network button. Yeah. 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 They just gobble up the other one. You can, you can dream along. Yeah. In that for yeah. sure. They might actually lower your uh, guy's cell phone bills by fifty cents <laughs> exactly. instead of bending you over with the strap on. <laughs> yeah, every one hundred cold. Yeah. Free. <laughs> um, so since we're on the hockey topic, uh, right. I, uh, well, we read that you did f over fifteen thousand interviews during your career. Is that about right, or is that an probably exact twenty twenty thousand no interviews? Well, if you include everything back to the Churchill days and and all of that, and you know, being around the world, I don't know how many times on different big stories, and so a lot, a lot of interviews. Who, who would you say was the probably the most uh, the biggest <laughs> out of the twenty thousand? No, <laughs> uh, 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 of, of the hockey guys, like following certain oh. stories. What was the most most memorable? Well, to you? you know, Wayne was always. I, I you know I talked to Wayne a number of times, so it's great being in this in this building that you're using for these shows this week. Um, and he was always there was you'd always get something new out of Wayne, always. Um, Drew McGinley. What was the year they were in? Uh, oh, 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 four. Oh, four. Oh, four. Yeah, against yeah. Tampa there. Yeah, uh, Tampa, that's right. Because I interviewed him in Tampa. I flew down there and interviewed him for one of the games. And, uh, you know, it was like a half-hour interview. He was great. So, I mean, lots, you know, lots of, uh, lots of great, either players or, or coach, uh, coaches, Scotty Bowman, mm -hmm. you know. And so I... You know, I never got never got Colby, but uh, you know, I tried. But <laughs> that was difficult. He charges to, too much. Trying to break through his his staff. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was hard. I, well, what's what's maybe in when you're starting out, no experience besides making calls at the airport, right? Uh, and then getting in there, and then do you remember like your first interview, or do you remember maybe oh, yeah. early like a super bad one, and you're <laughs> like, "What am I doing? I'm just I, a first one, at the airport." My first one was bad. I made the classic mistake. I was so nervous about doing it. This was in Churchill that I thought, okay, I need, they needed a feature interview for something. And I said, okay, uh, I'll interview a friend. That way it'll oh, be okay. Be easy. <laughs> Big mistake. Because <laughs> we basically went over the interview and I still have it on tape, you know? So I got it out of the CBC archives. I want to make sure nobody ever heard it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it sounds like we're reading, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. What did so you screwed. do? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was bad, uh, but you know I, I I got past that because it, listen the news business, it's not that complicated really, and in a way it's kind of like sports, in the sense that you, um, you ask what you think people are wondering about, what's on their mind. You don't have to you know some interviews will will try to make it sound like they think they're smarter than the person they're interviewing. Yeah. Right? yeah. When you're just asking the basic questions, right? And, you know, I grew up in a family that was always talking about current events around the dinner table at night. Um, and so I, to me, journalism is all about being fascinated by what goes on around you, willing to ask questions about what's going on around you, and then sharing those answers with people who are, you know, equally interested. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what's about, and that's what you guys do in your own particular style. When you're you're into your riff about different things that are happening in the, in the hockey world. After you became so well established and became such like a figurehead in Canada, was there anyone that that still made you nervous? Even twenty, thirty years into it, somebody you got, you're like, oh my, I got to be on my game for right now. Yeah, not uh, not any of the political figures. Um. Not any of the entertainment figures, but usually sports figures. Really? Yeah. I mean, as a as a kid growing up in Ottawa, my hero was uh, the, the quarterback initially for the Ottawa Rough Riders, then he went to Regina, Ronnie Lancaster. And I had to interview him somewhere in the, I guess it was the early 80s or, yeah, when he retired. And I was in Regina and I... I was so scared. Panicked. Panicked. <laughs> I went to his house and I was sitting in a kind of setup like this. You know, he was in a chair and I was on the couch and I was just shaken. I was so nervous. And, I, you know, it, it surprised me because I, by then I'd already interviewed prime ministers and this yeah. and that and 
hadn't got overly uh, uptight about it. I was in the White House interviewing Obama right after he became president, about a month into his, his term. And I thought, well, you're going to be nervous about this, but. You were fine. I was fine. <laughs> He was nervous, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How'd, the, how'd the interview go with the, the CFL quarterback? Lang with Lancaster? Ronnie? Um, Lancaster. It, Lancaster? It, it, Lancaster, yeah. It, it was, uh, you know, it was fine. He ended up as a great broadcaster for the CBC doing football. He's passed away now, too. And it, it, it's difficult when you start talking about these people that you've interviewed and they've passed away. Yeah. And you're going, uh-oh, yeah. this is not a good sign. <laughs> so as, as hockey players, we typically have routines before we go, you know, go to the rink, right. whatever, you know, belly button soup, talk about your morning, af <laughs> morning nap or, or afternoon nap. What, did you have a regular schedule that you would always follow? It sounds like to me, your job is pretty hectic. Have you seen the show, The Newsroom? Oh, yeah. I bet you yeah, did, yeah. yeah no, they is that sent, close? They sent me the, no, not really. <laughs> well, which newsroom are we talking about? Is it well, the Jeff Daniels the one? Jeff Daniels oh, one. the Jeff Daniels one. That's good. Because like shit's happening, you're doing stuff, oh, yeah. and you're like, hey, yeah, yeah. pushing your kids on a swing, pager yeah. goes off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and, and that's what happens, you know, like I, on 9-11, oh. that morning, I was in my doctor's office. It was my annual physical and I was just getting around to the part that you'd we read off. as an annual <laughs> physical. And my uh, pager went off. And those were the days of a pager. And I called in. I said, you got to get here. Some, you know, this plane just went into one of the towers. And there are all kinds of rumors around. We don't know what's happening. And so I said, see you later to the doctor and, and went straight in. And I was on the air for 44 hours. No way. But that's just like, that's what it's like when you're doing that kind of a job at the top level, you got to have a certain sense of a little bit of knowledge about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So you can carry a program. So you're constantly interviewing new people and they're scrambling, trying to find people for you to interview either remotely or on the set about what's happening, what could be happening. So that's what, you know, those days like that are, you know, are amazing yeah. because the team is so, incredible that you uh, that you have working with you um and people are looking at you and they they just want to they want to trust you they want to believe what you're saying and that's one of the big problems right now in, in journalism is trust as it is with a lot of different institutions and hockey's not you know uh, it's not ignored on that concern either as we've we've witnessed a number of times in the in the last little while um but nevertheless it uh you know, when you when you're into it, when a big story like that, or the small story, um, they can be just as exciting and invigorating. Did you ever get like, anything majorly wrong? Because you talk about always like no, I've never done anything. Wrong. <laughs> no, like because <laughs> you talk about the way that news is now, and I feel like yeah. it's very clickbaity, and that's just kind of how it's all gone. Like you never yeah. really got wrapped up into that. Was that something that you, you know, were, when social media started and it became extremely popular, there's no doubt that different news organizations um, started to mimic social media. TV news that sometimes became Twitter and clickbaity for one. And we've all been guilty of that somewhat. But, you know, being led down a a path and leading your viewers down a path where things are wrong, um, that can be a problem. I remember, <laughs> I remember the first thing I ever got wrong. It was when I was still in Winnipeg. I was doing a live show from the Winnipeg airport. A uh, big deal in Canada when royalty comes to the country, right? It was an even much bigger deal then, especially you know, the queen or something. But her sister, Prince Mar Princess Margaret, came to Winnipeg in about 72 or 73 to officially open the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Um, and so at that time, that was still a big deal to have Margaret come. So we did a live show of her arrival at the airport because it, it, it happened right in the middle of the supper hour show, news show. And so the, the anchor throws to me, Peter Ransford's live coverage from the Winnipeg International Airport. Well, well, I come on. I say, yeah, it's a very exciting moment. Uh, Princess Margaret about to kind of step off the plane. And there she is, Princess Margaret, uh, <laughs> waving to the crowd. Well, no, she's not waving. That's odd. They usually wave, and she's not wearing one of those special royal hats. <laughs> and 
what are those wings on the lapel of her? Oh, it was the flight attendant. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was the flight attendant. <laughs> and uh, so that when I got back to the newsroom that night, because I was, you know, I was kind of fresh out of Churchill, um, and the, <laughs> there were two pictures on my desk: one of Princess Margaret and one of a Air Canada stewardess, <laughs> stewardess as we called them then, uh, and was asked to do a piece for the late news on the difference between these two women. <laughs> So to you make know, light of it, hey, good thing there wasn't yeah. Twitter back then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the rip on oh, you. Oh God, yeah. Well, I that heard Peter been, Mansbridge yeah. started the uh, Otani rumors to Toronto. He actually, oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, did you? Yeah, he. It hasn't Peter's come out yet. <laughs> it hasn't come out yet, but he uh, he was tracking the flights <laughs> about the sushi <laughs> reservation oh, yeah. that they made. Yeah, yeah. He was so trusted, you know. Everyone believed. Yeah, I will tell you that I was sitting on my uh, the edge of my seat all that day. You know, I sort of bought into it all, just like we did with the Kawhi thing when yeah. he was flying back remember everybody thought oh that means he's going to sign for Toronto and all he did was come back to say he wasn't going to sign for Toronto but um the, those were two bad moments but we have Austin Matthews you do that's and right and nobody else has him that's unfortunately right. you don't have any defense when you're a goalie but you got <laughs> <laughs> oh that's why the pressure is always on Austin he's got to score lots of goals yeah, yeah. <laughs> what true. about um I always wonder because that many interviews 20,000 like any moments of people being standoffish or where you end up running into somebody who's grumpy and you end up having like kind of awkwardness yeah. to it? Oh, yeah. You, you definitely have. You guys are old enough to remember the Beach Boys? Yeah. 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 I interviewed Brian Wilson once, who was really the genius behind yeah. the, the Beach Boys, but he was a little odd, right? A little prickly? Well, it wasn't prickly as much as he was odd. Okay. He okay. kind of lived on another planet. Yeah. But uh, we'd arranged to do this interview. He's coming here to, to do a concert at Massey Hall in Toronto. And uh, I'd always been a big fan of uh, the Beach Boys and the Beatles. Did the same with Ringo Starr. But with uh, Brian Wilson, we sit down for a half-hour interview, right? He starts giving one-word answers. Oh, no. Right away. You're like, buddy, I got five minutes if you're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what he, yeah. what he did. And so that took a lot because, you know, you prep for these things, but you're not expecting that the guy's going to say yes, no, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Why'd you agree to do this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that's kind of the way we turned it. That's a very good. Yeah. Uh, you pre you promoing know. anything here, buddy? Like you want <laughs> yeah. to have a special yeah. show to sell tickets? It ended up with him uh, agreeing to, uh, or not agreeing, but offering me to come in and sing good vibrations with him that night at the concert. He'd obviously never heard me sing. Or <laughs> he never would have asked that. Um, but it turned out to be actually a great interview. And it's a great interview to watch because you can see what goes through an interviewer's mind when they're yeah. challenged that way. And they know they've got to fill the time. It's a, it's a, a panic. Sure. Like for me, oh, at yeah. least when we, you know, you get the occasional guy that's not, maybe not dying to do it or, and you're just, you start as the interviewer, you're like, uh, I can't do this anymore. Like I, I'm panicking right now. I got no questions. Left. <laughs> well, fun well, fiddling with the papers. It's funny. Uh, there, there are always questions, and, and you know, and, and yeah, and there are especially always questions if you listen. The biggest challenge on most interviews, big interviews. Um, I know you guys were up all night thinking about all. Oh, what I haven't stopped to away. <laughs> I've been reading your Wikipedia since two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's full of lies. In fact, the Wikipedia has me married to someone I've never heard of. Oh, okay. oh that's why I always say verify. We, we can't trust Wikipedia unless you get the actual that's like right. the, the source. Fine. But anyway, the point though? I was going to make is you got to listen. Yeah. In an interview, and uh, you, you can tell when you're watching somebody do an interview, a big, big possibly they're nervous or whatever they're not listening and lots of stuff goes by and all they're doing is looking down at their no. paper What's their next, next question What's the next question yeah. i was going to ask um the flip side of brian wilson was ringo Starr. you know I, I another era that i grew up in so getting a chance to interview ringo i can't remember it was five or ten years ago in los angeles was fantastic now how you can imagine how many interviews He's probably, oh, yeah. right? With m probably most of the same questions all the time. Yeah. But he made it feel like it was the first time he'd ever been interviewed and the first time he'd ever been asked these questions. He was funny. He was insightful. He was everything. He was, it was great. It was a great time on, you know, and worth the uh, trip down there to uh, talk to him. Did you get up and sing good vibrations with him? 
<laughs> with Ringo? Yeah. No, no, Brian Wilson. <laughs> with Brian? No, there was no way I would okay. put him through that. <laughs> you wouldn't need a, you wouldn't need a bottle yeah. of this yeah. stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, you got that right. I got to ask, being since your like your life story, right? And I, I, I've been bounced around Toronto a little bit and, and worked. There's a lot of people from out West come out here. Obviously you have to come out here to work and the big networks are all out here in Toronto. Right. Do you think your upbringing and moving and growing up in a small town and yeah, you ended up in Ottawa and then you know, of course, big city living, but mm -hmm. do you think like that sense of upbringing naturally just made you good with people or like a natural charm of like your e ease about you? Cause I think you have like, you have an ease calmness. about you. Calmness when you talk to somebody. Like, right. just very natural. That relaxes you. them. Yeah. It's, it's very, very natural. Yeah. I, I think the small town experience would have made that. Yeah. And I'm sure, you know, you guys, in your playing careers, you played in a lot of small towns. Mm -hmm. Different kind of atmosphere to that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the opportunity, when, I, when young journalism hopefuls come and ask me for advice and stuff, I always tell them, get out of Toronto. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to start small. Think big. You want to think big, that's good. But start small. You know, I like it. You know, we live in Stratford, Ontario now. We come into Toronto a lot. To, that's where Biebs is from, I think, right? That's yeah, where you, Biebs you is and from. Joe Thornton and Biebs. Well, Joe Thornton, St. Thomas. Oh, is that just what, about yeah, 15, yeah. 20 minutes away? Well, it's an hour and oh, okay. call All right, so, yeah. <laughs> But there's a lot of guys pass through Stratford. <laughs> Played at the old Allman Arena, built in 1924. Wayne got his first goal ever in organized hockey in the Allman Arena. There's a picture of him there. I was surprised. I, I didn't see it downstairs here. Um, I, I talked to Wayne. It's funny because he's not wearing a helmet. I don't think the goalie's wearing a, a, a mask. <laughs> That's crazy. Um, but I talked to him about it, and he, you know, he remembered it. And I talked to Walter about it, and he, he, he remembered it as well. Um, but... All these guys who came to, you know, Chris Pronger, Eddie Olchek, they all paid, went through Stratford. Like they played for the Stratford Junior B team. Uh -huh. um, and you know, Tim Taylor, there's a bunch of them. Craig Hartsburg, they all went through there. But, you know, you go through the NHL teams, you're going to see that in most squads, right? Yeah. yeah. Guys who played in small towns and the impact the small towns had on them. In many cases, that's where they met their wives. Yeah, They're wiser yeah. from places like that. Um, and so your point is a good one because you have, it's a whole different upbringing coming through a small town than it is in a big city. Yeah. So I tell kids, get out of Toronto. Go to a small place. I said, you couldn't have started a smaller night at Churchill, Manitoba. <laughs> you know, you couldn't hear the radio station a block out of town. Um. In fact, you couldn't get out of town. There was, there was no road. <laughs> you had to go on a train to get out or Is fly. Is Glenn Gullitson from there? Is he from up around there? Who? Glenn Gullitson. He's assistant That's coach. That's what Canadians do. With. They the ask Oilers. about guys. No, it's like, from hey, you're from Canada. I know John. Well, you got to know where all these guys are from. <laughs> That's right. It's kind of true. Though. I think, <laughs> you do do that. I think I do. your advice is similar in a sense to hockey or any sport where, all right, you got to dominate a level that, until to, to, to move up to the next level like you can't you can't get to the top right away so if you dominate a small town you go to a yeah. little bigger town you, you really prove yourself there and then that's how you get up to 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 or i guess Vancouver. but each level is a challenge too right yeah oh yeah you're you're you're, exactly. you're you're a big fish in a small pond yep you want to start over again as a little fish in the big pond and so each level you're challenged yourself personally and your family's challenged about do i want to move on the saying we used to have in churchill uh, was if you stayed more than three years, you'd probably never leave because you come so attached to it. Yeah. And you have your friends there, you like it, you've set up a new lifestyle. I left right at the three-year <laughs> mark. <laughs> One more week and I would, wouldn't have gone. But uh, anyway. that was, I, my, my ask was going to be like, what was your big break? Was it, did you just have a big year? Was there a particular interview? Like how did you end up making that next step? The big break was the airline announcement, really. Okay. Yeah. That's what started it. And then it was, you know, learning the skill, the trade. Being Putting ambitious together the by skills the sounds of it, too. Like Being ambitious. After I, you know, once I'd been in there for six months, I, saw, I said to myself, okay, I love this. And at that point in my life, I was just turned 20. I hadn't loved any of the jobs in particular that I was doing. I didn't see myself being in them for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um they were more in it 
to keep the money <laughs> going and, and to have fun. But when I realized this was something I loved, I put together a plan for myself about where I wanted to be within two years, five years, 10 years. And the end goal was where I ended up as the chief correspondent of the CBC. Now, I never would have told anybody that at the time. Yeah, they la they laugh at you. Then. Absolutely, they're like this loser rookie's doing vision board. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Before but, they were even yeah, they yeah, did vision the board. fuck is a vision yeah. board? Get them yeah. out of here. Let's yeah. get the coop. <laughs> I tell people, I tell kids, I said, you're not going to make every one of your markers, mm -hmm. but keep it in your mind. Some you'll get there before you thought you would. Others, it's going to take you longer. Um, but you'll still get there as long as you believe in yourself and you keep working at it. You mentioned leaving Toronto, but is it true you you almost left Canada for the United States? Is that true? I was going to ask if that ever ha did, came about. Yeah. Well, like a lot of Canadian journalists, I mean, we may we train and create the best journalists and you know some of the best journalists in the world. Um, I, you know, I was lucky. It was, it was around eighty seven, eighty eight. Um, I'd had a number of offers from NBC and CBS for correspondence jobs uh, overseas. Johannesburg, Paris, London. Um, but I always said no, because the CBC kept, you know, for a guy that they hired out of nowhere, they kept making things interesting for me. And then in 87, CBS offered me their morning show. Oh. As, as host. That had to be tough to turn that down. That was tough. At that point, I was the weekend anchor here. And uh, so I, I took it. I accepted it. But the CBC immediately came back with Nolton Nash, who was the anchor at that time of the National, said, we, we don't want you to go. He says, I'm, I was planning on retiring in the next year or so anyway. Why don't I retire now? You can have the job. Uh, and I thought, you know what? I, you know, I've worked towards this all my life. These guys took a chance on me, and, and they really took a chance on me. So I... Uh, so I did it, and people said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you're a good, loyal guy. Yeah, like, loyal they, they trained you. You got your reps. You came yeah. all the way up. They Did they you match know? the pay? Did, yeah, they did match you take the... a hometown discount like Matthews no. and Nylander? I what? took a hometown <laughs> discount. It makes theirs look like uh, peanuts. <laughs> no, they, they, it was about, uh, I don't know. CBC gave me about 20% of what the Americans had offered. Holy shit. Oh, but, what a loyal and guy. It was, money the, too. it was the best job in Canada. And yeah. you know what is it? The CBS morning thing, they've been through a dozen hosts since then. Um, you were the one that Nothing's ever worked. Cronkite was the host of the morning show, and it was a disaster. Yeah. And then he you know, eventually ended up doing the, uh, you know, well, the Thankfully evening. you did it. Was it because yeah. they reciprocated your energy and gave you carte blanche where if you wanted to go tackle a story, did you have to go through anyone or they just gave you the green light on everything? It was, was that CBC? Yeah. At that, at that time, is that no, one of the no, reasons? No, but I, you know, I had a lot of influence. Yeah. You know, too much. For, <laughs> for He's like Gretzky when Gretz management. walks into places. That's when... When Mansbridge walks in, everyone's like, oh, shit, there he is. Yeah, there he is. There he is. <laughs> Get the report out. Get the report out. Well, <laughs> pitch it to him. Pitch it to him. Like you, you had to cover a bunch of wars. Like some, some, Did you ever right. maybe bite off a little bit more that you can chew where you were like, ah, uh, maybe I shouldn't have traveled there to cover it. Maybe I should have just yeah. stayed, stayed local. I always wanted to know what it was like, especially in wars. And so I, you know, I did Afghanistan. I was in Iraq. I, I did, uh, you know, lots of Middle East stuff. Um, but nothing like what the correspondents do. The ones the guys that are there, in the midst yeah, of yeah. it. I mean, I'd go in and out for a week, right? They're there for, you know, six weeks to six months. And, uh, and, and they're constantly in danger of zones. Uh, you know, I, I was in a few, but nothing. In but, there. No. How do they get you in and out of there too, doing that in conflict areas? Like. Well, What's that like for you when you're doing it's a that? Lot I always like wonder that. The way they they you know get you to games, they show you around, and it's all you know business class, five star hotels, limos. Oh yeah, all that <laughs> breakfast buffet, <laughs> all of it. First no, 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 it's, to it's, just, it's just the high massage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I heard about that. <laughs> um, I re <laughs> strongly recommend <laughs> <laughs> the. Uh, um, now you go in like everybody else goes in, but in. in you know, it's changed a lot over my time when I initially started doing that stuff. It was just you and the crew. Now it's you security. and the crew and security. 
I mean, there's some, you know, some pretty rough places. Any close calls? Any yeah. like high, high danger? The threats? closest call I had was during one of the intifadas. Uh, and it was, uh, it was near Bethlehem of all places. We were in a hospital that was run by the uh, Palestinians. And um, it was surrounded by Israeli uh, troops. And we were inside the hospital. And I was with our correspondent at that time, Neil McDonald. And uh, we were trying to interview one of the doctors about the difficulties they, they were having. And he said, um, and there were no lights on in the place because uh, the Israelis had cut off the electricity. And they asked, okay, you got to, we got to get some light. So we got near a window and we were doing this interview. <laughs> Suddenly Neil grabs me by the shoulder. He pulls me out of the way. He says, for Christ's sake, that's bullets. That's shooting. They're shooting at you. As you're by the bouncing, window. Off, bouncing off the side of the uh, the wall next to the window. I never heard it. They said they didn't like your Beach Boys interview. Hey, hey, that, <laughs> that's how into the interview he was. He's got bullets yeah. flying by. Yeah. He's like, he's like I'm the listening. Story. Get the story. Next yeah. question. I got to listen to uh, this guy. I don't need these papers. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Speaking another Arabic. <laughs> we're flying. Uh, we're in that. Uh, are we okay on time? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, buddy, you we're taking a whole hour three hours, hour. right? You don't oh, you keep going, buddy. <laughs> yeah. This is a two-parter. <laughs> no, the um, I was in Afghanistan, and we were flying from Kabul to Kandahar, which is a flight of about an hour and a half. Um, and you're on a military plane, a, a C-130, a Hercules, Canadian Forces plane. Um, so we get out. We all we'd flown in uh, commercial into. Uh, a cobble and they they put us on the on this Hercules and they said, Okay, we got a problem. The plane can't get high enough. You gotta be above twenty thousand feet or whatever the, the, the figure was to avoid um ground fire at the plane. So we can't there's pressurization problems, so we can't do that. So we've got to fly low level. <laughs> and I thought or doesn't that, that doesn't sound right. It sounds like we're going to be closer. To yeah. the <laughs> no, we get really low. So they don't have time to see us. Suddenly we're above them and flying by them. I said, oh, okay. So how low will that be? He says, oh, about 100 feet. Oh, my God. I said, 100 feet. You're buzzing the tower. In a huge military plane. I think it's a, a huge monster. military plane. So my cameraman and I, are, we were up front in the cockpit. And if you've been in a Hercules, the cockpit's big. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of room. You can walk around. You can move around which the cameraman needed. So we take off from, uh, from um, Kabul, which is surrounded by mountains. So we had to go up over the mountains and, and end down. And then the whole flight is through, you know, some mountainous regions, a lot of hilly regions. So you're constantly, you know, going like this to, you know, to miss <laughs> going into a hillside. And I'd never seen it operate before. And I'd taken flying training and I'd been in the military, but the way it works on a flight like that, the pilot's flying, but the navigator is calling the shots. And he's standing beside the pilot with his hand on his shoulder, saying, okay, right 10 degrees, you know, left 10 degrees, drop your you know, speed to what, this, that, the other. And that was constant for 90 minutes. <laughs> Jesus. And I don't know whether they, they did it to us because I never saw anything, but uh, they had to take evasive action at one point. They said that we were, they were being fired at. I never saw any evidence of that. They might have done that just for a show for us. Oh, yeah. The whole thing was a show but, for you. But it, yeah. wor it, it worked. It scared the hell out of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was an experience I'll, I'll uh, certainly never forget. You're a big memento guy. You uh, Great Wall of China, you have a little piece of, yeah. of the wall. I'm not sure right. if that's legal. Uh, <laughs> the, the beaches at Normandy. You it's got a some big wall. Dude. It is okay. Not enough bricks to go well, around. They, they would notice. <laughs> what would you say is your is your most unique that you you've got? A well, lot of I, travels. I, you know, the, I have a piece of the the Great Wall of China. I've got a piece of the Berlin Wall. It was there the weekend it came down or started to come down. Um, I've got soil from Vimy Ridge. I've got stones from Juno Beach, D Day. And that's probably, you know, the, uh, I, I've got them all involved somehow in our stone fireplace. Hmm. So they're in there. Wow. Um, but there's probably the Juno Beach stuff that has the most impact for me, having done that, you know, uh, reunions and uh, various anniversaries of, of D-Day for so many times. And I walked that beach, it took me, you know, I walked that beach with my son. You realize 
these guys, and we lost like 350 Canadians that, that day, just in that one day, uh, landing at the beach. But these guys, they were from all over the country, you know, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario. They were, they were from most of the provinces. 18 years old, some of them. 18, 19, yeah. 20 years old. Guys who'd known each other all their lives. You know, they'd grown up together, some of them. They'd uh, enlisted together. They'd trained together. And suddenly they're there and they're being told, no matter what happens. Keep going. No matter, keep going. It's incredible. So, people are going to get shot. Guy beside you could get shot. You got to keep going. It's the only way we're going to take this beach. And so whenever I've walked on that beach, and I've walked on it quite a few times, I think of that and what that must mean like, you know, you're with your buddy and your buddy gets shot and he's lying there bleeding and dying and you got to keep going. Yeah. Those guys, and as you say, their ages, you go to any of those military cemeteries, you know, anywhere in Europe or, and elsewhere in Asia as well, Canadians in Hong Kong. And, and you look at the ages and you go, my God. You know, they, the things they never got to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the old they saved the world place. though, you know, and yeah. my, my, my yeah, father-in-law went to Normandy and, and he just said, it's, I would love to go over there and see that. He just said, it's so like, like you, like you said, it's solemn and you're just like taking it all in and appreciating yeah. it. So it's amazing what you've been able to do when, when the Berlin wall came down and you were there, was, was that more like celebration? Was that, was were those people? It was a, a mix okay. of both things. I mean, it, 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 it had happened suddenly Yeah, and the world changed, the literally changed that weekend. You know, I, we didn't know to what extent it would change, but the very fact the wall was coming down east and west berlin were going to be uh, reunited east and west germany were going to be reunited other countries were going to abandon communism as so well. did they fly you over just quick like you're here and all of a yeah. sudden this is happening you're on a plane i was i was at a constitutional conference in ottawa oh that sounds exciting and i kept saying <laughs> look at this look at what's happening we've got to get over there <laughs> so they finally said yeah okay go so, and that's what you do. You just fly all night and you get there and, and you do it. And fortunately, NBC was there, uh, you know, 24 hours before I got there and a match to, uh, uh, and who was able to set up a whole system that we were able to piggyback on. So, and, and so within an hour of being there, I was broadcasting. So it all, it all worked, uh, it all worked uh, quite well, but it was this mixture of celebration and stuff. And there were people coming through families you know, reunited, hadn't seen each other in 30 years. Holy shit. You know, it was all, it was all quite something, something to see. Were, were you um, in, in Vancouver for the 2010 Olymp That must have been an amazing celebration, right? And you're, yeah. and you're kind of spearheading all the coverage. And Well, unfortunately, the CBC didn't have the rights to the Vancouver oh. Olympics. Oh, really? CTV had. Wow. Uh, but I was there for the whole two weeks because, you know, you were concerned that something might happen and, you know, you need to get on the air to, uh, to deal with it, something other than sports, but, uh, but it, you know, all, all went well, but it's still, the city was alive and, yeah, you know, and, and, and it had a, a great end result in, uh, in, uh, in hockey terms. There's my question. You got one for us? When the draft happens. Yeah. Who would you pick first? If you were the captain of the team that gets to pick first of all those players, for the All-Star Game. For the All-Star Game. Who so the pick? captains are McDavid, McKinnon, Matthews, and... Another guy. Hughes brothers. The Hughes brothers. The Hughes brothers. Uh, so Hughes brothers. I'm, on the, I'm on the McKinnon train right now. Well, he's already you a captain, though. Him. He's a oh, captain. He's, oh, okay. So like, I'm, Sid? I'm probably, gra I'm probably grabbing... Uh, yeah, Sid, maybe just because it's such a legend, or, or, or Pedersen. Pedersen, if he's right, he grabbed like that. Like I, I said on Monday night when I was working Rogers, because I left Sid off because I don't want to be biased, because, you know, I love Sid. Uh, Barzal. Yeah. I think yeah. with the format and the way he skates, the way he controls a puck, love watching him play. Do you agree, since you're Mr. Canada too, about what Biz says that USA is coming for all our hockey stuff now? They're going to take us over. They're taking over hockey, the USA hockey kids. Well, they just, they just won World Juniors. Look at the pattern they're on. I know, but like, you have any pushback on that as a Canadian? Or are you just going to give in? Go back to Churchill and start oh, yeah. a youth program. Yeah, we're going to get strap on the skate for that. Um, no, you know, I, listen, they, they've got it. You know, they've got a huge pool. Yeah, potential. 
And you just have to, you know, look at what's happened in the last few years in terms of some of the players coming along. There'll still always be that Canadian thing about hockey that will have an influence on on players. Do you think we're losing but that? Event? Coming after this and beating us are two different things. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt they're coming after us on all levels, whether it's men, women. Mm -hmm. I mean, the the women contest. Oh yeah, that's good. Is something else. You didn't tell me though. Who, who would you pick? Um, I would probably pick Nylander because you know the rich get richer, and I think that he's probably going to end up winning. It's the, the number one overall uh, All Star game, no matter which team you're captain on. He, he, well, because this cause is Ma how big of a Leafs job. Ma 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 is. Matthews is a captain, correct? I know, but there are four captains. Yes, so, I don't know who's getting the. So first I, overall I think pick. that I, if I'm Matthews, I'm picking Nylander. You want your teammate and the camaraderie and just somebody that you're comfortable with, three on three. And as far as RA, I got Kucherov. Uh, oh, like, like, oh. Like, like everyone, we all forget him. Yeah, yeah, he's we been playing his ass I, off. I, all, yeah, I, I, I would, uh, I do what Colby's done, not because I'm a pal <laughs> uh, of Sid's, but because he's Sid. And he's, he's got a he hell of a year. Of it. No, he's and, uh, and, and he's Sid. I mean, I think it would be a real whoever's makes that first pick. Maybe it is Matthews. I don't know, but they should they should pick Sid. Um, we glanced over it. All right, so you were enlisted in the Navy, Canadian Navy. Yeah. What like what was that experience life? Like what life like life lessons? I was did in it teach? pilot training. Okay. I was a flyboy. I was we had a believe it or not, Canada had an aircraft carrier then, the Bonaventure. It was stationed off the uh, east coast out of Halifax. And they flew trackers, uh, which was a a two engine plane and the wings folded up that the, the were uh flew off the bonnie and i had this dream of wanting to do that like top gun kind of like the pretty much that kind of well it's a, a prop plane it was oh, okay plane. i could see you playing volleyball yeah, you look like the tom cruise no a little shirt on <laughs> that's right yeah uh, you've yeah. got but anyway you already so i trained wings. for that i got through primary flying school which was in uh, um near barry uh flying a little plane called chipmunk single engine then I went to Portage to Prairie and flew uh, uh, twin engine planes, expediters. Um, didn't make it through that. Have you seen that Masters of the Air show from HBO I've yet? I started watching I started it. last night. It's pretty good. Yeah. The the images are fantastic. Those guys were legends. Holy yeah. shit. Like we that's were talking what, about. That's what my dad who was not in the American Air Force. He was in the British Air Force in the RAF. And he flew Lancasters, which was the British equivalent of what really? these guys are flying in that series. And uh, he did 52 missions, um, which is a lot of missions. So when yeah. you consider that in the first five, the odds were one in three that you were going to get killed oh, on your God. first five missions. He did 52. He did 52. What made your dad move to Canada or your family? We moved from England after the war to Malaya and ended up in another war. And my parents, we had, there were two, two, two of us as young kids, my sister and I, and he... Um, the, my, my mom and dad decided we, we got to give him a chance. You know, we can't continually live in a state of war. So he moved to Canada where he took a, a extremely low level job in the uh, public service in Ottawa and kind of worked his way up. And, um, and so obviously for my sister and I, it was, uh, you know, it was the best thing that could happen. How old were you then, sorry? Six when we okay. got here with my cricket bat. <laughs> but like you've been around all that your dad was involved in that the history it triggered oh, yeah. your brain yeah and that's why you're just like this been i mean humbly speaking for you of course <laughs> this legendary canadian broadcaster of canada like i look like at youtube clips i remember watching you when we won the memorial cup guys we got a message from peter mansbridge that was like a huge deal right <laughs> that was like that made me like wow we won the memorial cup yeah that was like the moment because he was like yeah we heard you all the way out here in toronto at the national like his voice yeah, yeah. like the way he does it we had a video and a little clip from you how you gave us a little shout out from your from your news desk and i was just like holy shit well we made all the difference in there when yeah yeah exactly <laughs> well, what was your first reaction when you saw peter man's biz Yo. Oh, <laughs> we like, that was fuck. so we were doing a mcdonald's ad and I, I had to be a news anchor and i'm like fuck it i'm going all in like for, for the legend i was trying to pay homage but i don't know how it was going to be received right like i didn't honored. know if it was going to be a Lula was honored. type response or or, or i know. was honored just like i was in uh won an academy award an oscar for zootopia 
Yes. The moose. Oh, yeah. the moose I, I'm in there for 12 seconds, my voice. Oh, my yeah. God. I've watched that with the kids. Yeah. That's yeah. you. Peter yeah. Moosebridge. Yeah. yeah. They call me. Holy yeah. shit. So I, that was a that was a highlight of my career. Yeah. Not man's best. Well, <laughs> now you got to raise, raise attention. I'm waiting yeah. for the award. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You get a free Happy Meal. That's about it for the yeah. McDonald's ad you did. You said Malay. Is that like what was Malaysia back then? It's uh, Malaysia now. Now, it was right? Malaya yeah. then. I yeah. flipped that. Flipped that around. So and that was wild. one of the reasons he went there was to help them establish basically independence. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And we lived there for three years. And it's you know it's right on the equator, so uh, you know it's a pretty nice place to live. Uh -huh. we treated well until the shooting started. Yeah. It was a bit of a mess. So. Well, I was going to say, go you've, you've, get, you've given so much to Canada. Was there anything when you retired that you wanted to accomplish for yourself or for your family? Did you go on like a like a big world tour? Like, is there still something that you feel that you need to accomplish in your life? That's a, it's a major thing? Um, uh, probably not. You know, I mean, I, I've, uh, yeah, I was extremely lucky in all the time I worked uh, at the CBC. I'm still working. I do a daily podcast. Um uh, which is deals in you know politics and current events. I uh, give the odd lecture at the University of Toronto. I have a media consulting business. Um, you know, I, I I I do a you know a number of things. I write books. I've got got a current. I've written four books since I retired, and that was only seven years ago. So uh, I'm still you know enjoying the work side of life, but I'm also enjoying the not having to work. <clears throat> you know, every day, like at your uh, own pace, at my own pace. And that's the trick. Um, we, uh, we wanted to, uh, my wife's an actor, so she's fairly you know, well known in the country and it would, it's hard for us to go anywhere without people yeah. recognizing us, you know? Um, and so we, uh, we're traveling, we did a lot of traveling in different parts of the world. We decided we love Scotland. So we, uh, we have a place in Scotland up way up north in the highlands right on the north sea that homage to the former queen that's where she spent her summers you're right yeah she used to drop over for you know, <laughs> a cup of tea, tea. Yeah. Right. Is it, is it, <laughs> wasn't a stewardess <laughs> is, it, hey, is it also the lushness of of like scotland i, I oh, yeah. basically everywhere in britain that's Bezos, what does Bezos it for smoked me. that whole country <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's green i went and played in cardiff during the lockout and oh, yeah. you know we would drive to to sure. brayhead and you know go yeah. play in those teams and you're just on the bus through these rolling hills and everything's so lush and beautiful. And yeah. it's just, it's we're right by uh, Royal Dornick, which is one of oh, the what greatest course. courses in the world. I got to play it once. Oh, you play it? Incredible. Oh yeah. No, it's a fantastic course. Um, so we're, we're close there. So it's a lot of golf. I'm a terrible golfer, but my son is, a, is developing into a really good golfer. Um, so we're, we, uh, we love it over there. We've got some, uh, some friends who know nothing, uh, wouldn't know anything about what I uh, used to do, but I said I have built a. We, we got a, a couple of old barns, attached them together, renovated it, and um, and I built a little studio in there. So I still do my podcast every day, and with wow. Scotland or here or Stratford. Awesome. Would you go to Scotch if you if you drink? Um, I love the odd Scotch, <laughs> especially on the course. I have, oh yeah have a flask oh you know? yeah and yeah. you need it there and it warm you up something something's different over there like i'm not a big whiskey drinker but over there it just tastes a little better yeah cold windy day you get, yeah, the, get exactly. the flask on the course exactly i got i got a question um because you mentioned in terms that we're not p political people or a political podcast but you mentioned the, how the news has changed and the trust issues and yeah. in a sense like you almost got a little lucky when you retired, like 16 trumpet comes into office and everything's just gone completely haywire. Like you got to almost be like, I'm kind of glad I'm completely out. I'm, I'm just out of like, out, you have your podcast, but I'm not in the yeah. midst of where people just hate reporters and hate correspondents. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and the, the thing for me is, it, it, is it odd to you to see how every station has like a political leaning and was it always like that? Or is it just gone no, so no, crazy? It was crazy. crazy. Newspapers always have yes, yes, you know, uh, you know, an opinion section and an editorial uh, team that would make a decision about how they wanted. They'd to. lean uh, one way or the other, exactly. But the reporters, the news never paper, did, were just reporters. You know, sometimes their headlines would be twisted by the the editorial page people. Um, 
but there's there seems to have been a change in the way that's moved and also on television there's a lot more opinion in television pieces than there used to be which is i have a problem with yeah it's just um, the news right yeah. it, and so in did. terms of the specialty networks i mean you you see what's happened in the states you got fox doing its its right wing uh, thing and then you've got msnbc that has basically decided our path is going to be the opposite to fox and all their commentators at night um uh, take a more left wing approach their journalists are still all pretty good including some of the ones at fox uh some are, uh, are friends of mine in all three networks but uh, but the pushing of opinion has really colored things a lot, and that has um, that has cost media generally on the on the trust. It's a little poisonous yeah. now, where it's like you just well, I can't yeah, get just that tell way. us the damn news. We don't need really your opinion on it. Yeah, it's, or it's, you're it's, arguing on it, or you're inflating of things because you have to say something crazy yeah it's so no, you're right so do you don't do that at all if you if you decide to talk politics on your podcast like you you know you've been around a while you've seen things change like do you ever give your opinion on on what you think might I, need to change or are I, you happy with the state of where like maybe i Cal is try to keep my opinion out of it in terms of issues that directly impact us our country mm -hmm. but um I have not been hesitant in saying what I think of uh, Trump and some of um, some of his actions. Let's put it that way. Um, and I think uh, you know it's going to be a really interesting year as a result of that because there's going to be an impact in terms of what happens with him uh, for what happens here as well. So I think uh, you know. It, the luxury of the podcast, I mean, I own it. I do it. I can do whatever I want on it, right? I'm, I, I'm not the CBC voice anymore. You're not answering to anyone? No. Um, so, I, you know, I make a decision about, you know, the things I, I want to say. But on in terms of directly covering the Canadian news, I try to stay in, a, in as much of a center lane as I can. Yeah. Yeah. The, but Seth mentioned that like a lot of disdain like the last you know six eight years you think it, that's because there's so much like intentional misinformation and, and like straight up propaganda available now like you know there's channels on cable in the states that I mean it, they're not they're just blatant propaganda we didn't have that like eight ten years ago and no. I think you know no. that's really messing the with the waters like what just said yeah it's you know it's a result of social media it's a result of the expanded universe of news channels and needing ratings too, right? Needing ratings. I mean, listen, Fox is a hell of a business. They make a ton of money. Mind you, they've had to give some of it back because of <laughs> the fact they've been lying. <laughs> but um, but I, I mean, I, the two things to keep in mind are there's a difference between disinformation and misinformation. Misinformation is simply you're wrong. You know, you got it wrong. Mm -hmm. It was a mistake legitimate mistake your research was bad or this that it wasn't deliberate disinformation that's deliberate and when they do it they're doing it for a reason trying to influence whether you how you vote what you buy where you go all of that stuff um and people need to call that out misinformation happens people mm -hmm. will make mistakes and a, a good news organization will concede that and say, yeah. we were wrong about this and we want to correct the record. You we, won't hear them say that about disinformation because they're doing it for a reason. Yeah, we, they, yeah. we, we just do that. a hashtag rumor boy. Yeah, we don't, we, we, don't make, we make up anyway. We don't apologize. After yeah, I've noticed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I got a headline for you. Um, <laughs> this might be misinformation. Peter Mansbridge, known hoarder collects rocks from all over the world yeah. hoards them in his house is that miss or dis is that miss or dis <laughs> wanted that's, by the that, chinese government <laughs> yeah for, st for stealing the wall <laughs> breaking news yeah. that's right news. that's right <laughs> i'm gonna break it as peter man's miss <laughs> oh, man. you're a you're a truth teller colby <laughs> but there's nothing inaccurate about what you said <laughs> nothing, thank you i i, I my, my last one for you is um the clip that comes to my mind is is that lunatic Bill O'Reilly screaming, fuck it, we'll do it live. Like, <laughs> did you ever have like maybe a little meltdown on a producer oh, where you yeah. felt bad? Like no, never. No, you're always <laughs> <laughs> No, you did. You did. You did. I was gonna say, you oh, know, listen, I would get I, I would get upset too. But uh, I the one thing 
and the, 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 you guys don't have to worry about it, is I always was very careful about where my microphone was and whether it was on. Oh, yeah. Hot mic. Hot mic. That'll take, I mean, yeah, I, that'll take anyone I, down. I always wore a headpiece and I always made sure before I put it on that it was, um, that I, if, if I was talking, I would hear it, whether I was in your on ear. air or off air. Oh, okay. And, you know, you can tell the difference and, you know, you hear your voice differently when you can actually hear it through a microphone. The other thing I did was I, I never went, you know, I never went into the studio until the very last moment. Yeah, I don't want to be there early either. No, not that any, I'm not like you for two reasons. I don't want to sit there with all the lights on, and everything ready, everybody talking about getting up and being ready for it. I also don't want to be there because the, I got a microphone on. <laughs> right? so, um, so I would always come in and it would drive the floor director and the camera operators crazy. I would come in, you know, minute, 30 seconds before the opening theme. I just come in, put the stuff on, and bingo, we were there. Uh, and to me, that was <laughs> that was the safest and also the best for me because, you know, I I would get nervous. You asked about nerves. I would get nervous for every show I ever did. Same. Oh yeah. I know. I'm sure it's before the puck drop. Your live right? TV heavy topics, like know your shit. Like you got to yeah, be like all of that and understanding that you know, in my case, what you do is important to people. Yeah. Or they wouldn't be yeah. watching. So, you know, I, I was always routine. a little bit nervous, but once you're through that first 10 seconds, bingo. Yeah. You're in. Game you're on. In hockey game. It's like taking your first hit. hit. Take, exactly. Getting hit it's early like taking in the your game. first shift. The only problem when I was playing in the NHL, that would take about three quarters <laughs> of a period. So, fuck, I sit there with nerves the whole time by the time I got out there. So, you get yeah. the luxury to just snap it around after 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, He's on Wayne Gretzky. That's a, yeah. that's a nice, so, you would, was it like a fight or flight thing before every single thing that you did, whether it was an interview, whether it was a Yeah, life? I mean, there was a level of yeah. nervousness. So, you know, it wasn't like I was falling over. I remember the first uh, the first show I ever did uh, of a, a live uh, special nature, um, big one, a big a political one, was the seventy two election in Manitoba, and I was sitting there with the main anchor, a guy named by the name of Bill Guest, and we'd done a, a few rehearsals. I was kind of the color guy talking about the, the what the political impact of certain decisions the public might make was. So we go on, it was like eight o'clock. We sign on, or no, so it's like a minute before sign on. Everybody's tense. And I look over at Bill, who is a fantastic broadcaster and a veteran. I look at him and underneath the desk, his hand is, is like this. And I'm looking at him going, this is my first show and he's shaking. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I said, Bill, you, you're nervous? And he just looked at me and he said, Listen, kid, the day you're not nervous is the day you shouldn't be doing it anymore. There you go. You got to realize the stakes. It drives the energy, and it does. Yeah. No rush. You know, there's eh? been a few yeah. times where I haven't been, and like you said, you're just like, oh, fuck, something's off. Like, I'm not, I don't have <laughs> any juice. When you're done, like, an evening news report or something, like, even when you're doing, say, your 9-11 broadcast where you're on yeah. for 40 hours straight or whatever it was, like, was it even hard to sleep after that? Because I get yes. home after oh, hockey yeah. games at night, and I'd you know, work a double header. It's like one o'clock in the morning, Vancouver right. just spanked someone and I get home, but I'm like on live TV, just did the post game show. And you're like, you're still buzzing. You're like, processing yeah. everything. Still. Yeah. And you're like, oh, what yeah. did I say? Did I say something? Big dumb? shows, oh, big shows for sure. 9-11, a big election night, anything where you were on for any length of time, you couldn't sort of leave and go home and yeah. go to bed. Um, it, it would take a lot of kind of winding down um, I was trying to think of one after the Quebec referendum in 1995, which if you remember, it was very close. I remember. Right. When they tried. Was it 51%? Yeah. Separating. Yeah, yeah. It was basically about. 51, 49 was the voters. Was that right? close? Yeah. It was, uh, it was like 50 and a half to 40 oh, yeah. and a half. Okay. It was very oh, close. So it was a hell of a night. But when it was over and we finally signed off, couldn't go to sleep for sure. So a couple of us went for a walk around downtown Montreal, which is, as you guys know, is always alive in yeah. some fashion. And I'm thinking, okay, here's a night where this place has just had the biggest question ever put before it and the closest result. 
in other places that I've been to in the world on nights that even remotely resembled that, there'd be like fires in the street, yeah. Yeah. you know, fighting. There'd be all kinds of stuff going on. And here we are in Canada and people are sitting in bars, people who are on both sides of these is- that issue. Um, one side was disappointed. The other side was not happy. They were like exhausted in relief. But I was thinking, that's such a Canadian. Canadian. Yeah, man. we're very fortunate. Yeah. yeah. Hey, good election there, bud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was yeah. that was yeah. one of the final questions I was going to ask you. Just like how grateful, like how grateful are you that you were raised in in, in Canada? Like it's such an amazing well, I, country. It is, you know, and and for it's not like we don't have issues. We have issues, mm-hmm. and and they need to be addressed. And we've all kind of been slow to realizing that on some of the the big social issues that we face. But we're still this amazing country. It's big, it's diverse in every fashion, geographically, resource, culture, everything. Um, and all you have to do, as some of you have done, and I've certainly done, is travel the world mm-hmm. and see how other places live. So it's not ignoring the issues we've still got to address, but it's a pretty good place yeah, totally. to live in. And people would trade anything to be there. When they hear you're from Canada, oh, man, they're jealous. You know, uh, I, I got one last one. Uh, what are your thoughts on immigration? <laughs> <laughs> Peter, <Hot> thank you <laughs> yeah, <hot laughs> so much. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, this has been. Oh, amazing. I want to know. It's great. Who are your uh, unbiased Peter Mansbridge, um, the national 50 years unbiased? pick for the Stanley Cup. And I know you're a leaf blower. And and is it coming back to Canada? I think we're, um, ask me that in two weeks. Okay, okay. we'll get you back a little, on. Because a little closer to the deadline. We'll get a reporter. Yeah, but I, you know, I, I, once again, I, I agree with Biz here that I think, uh, that's where you went wrong. Samsonov has turned a corner. Let's go. Uh, Let's if, go if, 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 uh, if it's real and the, you know, three games is just three games, yeah. but he was incredible in those. So days. you're you talking know what, you know for what? Stanley Sh- cup. Sh- Sh- I I'm talk- saying I'd like to, I, I, th- I can see that. So I can see that Vancouver Toronto thing. I would like I to can. think that in my lifetime, you get to see it. I get to see something like that, but uh, that I get to see a, a Leaf victory. Uh, or at least after 21 years, a Canadian victory in the Stanley Cup. And I think, I think this is going to be the year where that's going to happen. There's just too many good hockey teams. Unless they start to crater after the uh, All-Star break, you know, Vancouver, Winnipeg, Edmonton can't win forever. Want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, like Shane Doan, I play with him, a guy I respect. He's like a mentor sure. to me. He compared the the Samsonov thing to, to is it Trey Turner who played for the Phillies? Is it? I think it, I think he completely folded in the playoffs. No, opposite. So he had a really really rough regular season. Oh, okay. And he was really struggling, and I think he went like you know zero for three, zero yes, right. for four. I went right. on like a twelve fifteen game like awful drought. And, but the Philly fans were still getting oh, yeah, standing that. O's and cheering for right. him. Where I feel like Samsonov, he went, got sent to the minors, cleared waivers, everything. Yeah. But yet, Leafs fans have still embraced him and really gave him that standing well, O. That, that two on none. That right. That yeah. really kind <laughs> that of turned, turned a corner. But even before that, I feel like they were being supportive where sometime in this market, if you're not playing well, they're going to give you the bluebirds. Where I feel like that support even before he had that two on O and that big one nothing win against Winnipeg. I feel like they the the fan base elevated him, and he's he's reciprocating that energy that they provide him, and that's why I actually that's why I believe. And then Trey Turner, of course, finally ended up turning the corner, and he went on this crazy run. They made playoffs, and I mean, would they get beaten the the, the semis? Yes, but, but maybe they, it's a but different. they need they need more than Sammy. I I know I understand. Okay, these are the big know, questions. Don't kill Domi my Domi here. and um, and and Bertuzzi have got to they've got to turn the corner. Mm-hmm. Big time. Hey, Big time. Who would you want to get? Okay, Stanley Cup. You still, I'll ask you in two weeks. That's fair. <laughs> Who would you get as a trade deadline approach uh, coming up here? That's a big topic. What teams are looking for, what they need. What do you need with the Leafs? D. Anyone in particular? Takes a, real, takes a real genius I, to figure out they need some D. 
Mm -hmm. uh, chicken would be great, but uh, they, uh, how are they going to make that happen? The big guy is Tanev. Yeah, that's I, what everyone I'm, says. I'm not there. Mm -hmm. um, Tanev. I was there on Zadorov. Oh, yeah, same that's here. what Biz was. Biz was bummed yeah. they didn't get we him. We needed that. But uh, big ogre. But but who? You know, maybe, there must be others out there because they need help on D. Do you pick up the phone and call Shani? Are you that big? <laughs> not Shani, but uh, his boss. Tree. <laughs> oh, the oh, even I. I, I see Leafs Tree's dad. Tree's people. dad stays at the same. Jim. Jim stays at the same. You back channeled a Jim to Tree. Yeah, sick move. Right. I remember telling. <laughs> I remember telling Jim on the day one of the season. I said, "They win tonight." Tree's gonna be a hero. We're gonna do yeah. a special. They lose. It's the beginning of the a special <laughs> special Dragons One Day. Game. Everyone goes yeah. on a pitch and, and, and sees what the team needs, and yeah. whoever wins, they get it picked. And what That's about so Keith? What about Keith? I like uh, Keith. I don't. I don't think. I, I don't think you have any reason to get rid of Sheldon Keith. I think right now. you give it till the end of the season. And, yeah. if, and if you don't like what you've seen throughout the rest of the season in playoffs, if I mean they're in a wild card right now, so they might not even make it, but. I think after that you make a decision. I think it would be too hostile if you try to. I think them. you got. You know, he's not the one who signed some of these yeah. people, right? He's the coach. Right? He's got to deal with what they gave him, and he's got percentage-wise probably the best record any Toronto coach has ever had. Right. He's I think four or five in in wins overall in the history of the Leafs. Um, and so I I think that would be the wrong place to start. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Told you Samson off was a low key great sign a couple of years ago, didn't they, Biz? Yeah, it just took a, <laughs> took a while to come out. Two sure. weeks ago, I would have just. <laughs> You said ship, yeah. Get him out of here. This one's a hard plane here. I can't even take my goddamn garbage can to the curb. We got guys like Peter Mansbridge yelling at me. What's going on? Send him off the boat with the growlers. All right, before we go any further, here's a few words from our friends at ZipRecruiter. Our friends at ZipRecruiter conducted a recent survey and found that the top hiring challenge employers face for 2024 is a lack of qualified candidates. But if you're an employer in need to hire, here's good news. ZipRecruiter has smart tools and features that help you find more qualified candidates fast. And right now, you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash SC. Here's how ZipRecruiter's tools and features help you find the best people for your roles. As soon as you post your job, ZipRecruiter's powerful matching technology shows you candidates whose skills and experience match it. You can use ZipRecruiter's Invite to Apply feature to send top candidates a personalized invite to encourage them to respond to your job post. Let ZipRecruiter help you conquer the biggest hiring challenge, finding qualified candidates. See why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Just go to this exclusive web address right now to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash SC. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash SC. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Huge thanks to Peter for jumping on with his biz. This guy is like just, you know, absolute legend up there, hey? In I Canada. wanted to pay homage to him when we did this uh this silly YouTube vi video, me and Pasha chopped up, and then that's ended up being the bet as well when uh, we went to the Eastern Con or Western Conference Finals. So yeah, that's how it all sparked. Then I went on his podcast at some point, and then, of course, we wanted to return the favor and get that legend on ours. And uh, some great stories, uh, uh, you know, a an incredible run in TV and uh, just a machine. So thank you to him for coming on, and, uh, and it was a good time. Yeah, good stuff. Oh, guys, I, I so ooh, ooh, you ooh. guys were just, before we just went to break, you guys were talking about uh, um, Austin Matthews potentially breaking Gretzky's goal record. You said, I wonder what John Bouchergross thinks of this. So I texted Bucci and I said, the boys are on the pod right now and they're wondering if you think Austin Matthews can break Gretzky's goal record just like he predicts, predicted Ovechkin's. And he said, you mean Ovechkin? And then he went on to say, I don't think he'll break it. He has a history of injury. Ovechkin never did. Poppy will need 900. <laughs> Wow. I, I don't know. I, huh. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. But, I mean, cause, oh, Very I mean, interesting. Ovi slowed down quite a bit this year, but we'll keep tabs well, on so, it as so, always. So one, of, so one of the discussions we had about amount of punishment you take as a center iceman and how much more skating, 
But then to the contrary, like look at how hard that Ovi was playing even as a winger. Like the amount of damage he probably even inflicted to himself from running around the way he did for so many years. So I just think with the way that they're training now and the way that they got their diets dialed in, that they actually, if you're really taking care of yourself and you're as dedicated as Matthews is, your your longevity will be greater. That's my that's my prediction. Obviously, tough to argue with what Ovi's done for from his longevity perspective, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it, it, it'll come down to the wire. This next one, Biz, a uh, very unique story. So the National Predators, they had asked permission to uh, go to Vegas early. They wanted to go see U2 at the Sphere. You know, the, the Sphere, we're always talking about it. I mean, I think it's sort of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. You two may never go back there. It's a, a unique setting. But anyways, they played like shit, 9-2 uh, to two lost. All of a sudden, the trip got canceled. They were supposed to take all the staff. The players were, like, treating a whole bunch of people to this thing. And uh, I thought originally it was Andrew Brunette, but it seems like Barry Trotz, he was pissed off about it. He says, we don't have bad culture. Our standards had slipped below expectations. When you have young players, you have to send them a message that you can't be rewarded if your standards and your preparation slips below your principles. So they're basically punished because they had a bad couple games and they can't see you two at the sphere. I know it's only a fucking concept, but is this something that could, like, I don't know, backfire in some way or guys just say, fuck it, it's a bump of the road, move along? Wait, you want this one first? Uh, no, I feel like you got an opinion on this, so go right ahead. I'm, I'm a little bit softer, and I would have thought that, you know what, we just got pumped, we're not playing great, you need a little outing to, to put a little bit of fun back in your life, right? Nobody wants to get pumped. I feel like, yes, doing what he did might have guys react the other way. But then people also might say that my opinion's soft on that. That's something that, like, back in the day when I was playing junior, I don't know if Dave Tippett would have exactly done did something like that. But, uh, yeah, I, would, I wouldn't have done it. If I was a coach, I probably would have used the bullet. Yeah, they were looking to cancel it, but I said, no, we need a team outing. So let's go have some fun. But bring your fucking effort back next practice and next game, and let's fucking get going here. Yeah, it's a tough one, man. They they were at home and they got completely embarrassed. So looking at the old school way, like as a coach, you're like, well, they don't deserve to go do this. What sucks is that like, they were bringing the training staff and the equipment managers, so it's a real kick in the dick for everyone. But for me, it's like, yeah, dude, if you're going to be on home ice and get completely waxed like that with that effort. By the way, the coolest part of that night was the fact Duchesne scored two goals and then was lead singing, playing guitar at Tootsie's. Like that might be one of the most legendary NHL nights I've ever heard of. Shout out Dallas too, maybe the least discussed best team we've ever they had. They like it like that. Yeah, I know. It's almost good. Like nobody talks about it, but every, I get random texts from people like, hey, you, you like a... You like a sleepy future on a cup where I'm like, just bet Dallas, just bet Dallas. They're <laughs> going to be in it. They'll, they'll be in the Western Conference final. But I I, I see where Burnett's coming from. It would have sucked to be on that team or, or a, a part of the staff of that team. But man, like you're, 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 you're you got completely trucked in your own building. And, and, and in his mind, he's like, all right, well, they're probably already thinking about going to Vegas. And I was nice enough to say, yeah, we can go early. You can do this. It, it's definitely a tough decision. Probably now in the NHL, you don't see this as often. But I'm, I mean, I guess I look back to when I played, although we always tell the story that Edzo said if we won a game, we could have two days off and then we lost 6-1. And he goes, I take the two days off. So there's a different <laughs> mentality to different coaches. But that's just him saying this is embarrassing. Like you can't play like that and expect to be rewarded after you guys asked me we could go out there early. Um a hard decision to make for a coach, though. I'm sure he kind of thought about it. And then in the end, he was that mad and pissed off and just said, nope, no fun for you guys in Vegas. You got under 30 games left in your season. You're two points outside of a playoff spot. Yeah. I just think it's time to remind them, hey, we didn't need to fucking do this. This is not how you treat your fans at home, but I still go. So that's how I feel about it, R.A. And, and the, the argument like the old would school be, sternness. if you're going to let them do it after that trouncing, like – you know that in Vegas, they're going to have a big effort, right? You, or maybe as a coach, you'd think, all right, these guys are going to be going balls to the wall after I give them this party after that beatdown. But Trotz talked about it, right? Like, you got to set the tone, and 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 that's not a, at all what he wants to see a team play like at home. And and so they made the decision. I wonder if Trotz was involved. Oh, yeah. No, he was. I think he was the, 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 the architect of the whole thing. I mean, obviously, Burnett answers to him. And he said it was about the Predators and the fans, not about the players on the team. You know, they're going through somewhat of a well, rebuild on the fly. And 
He says, you know, I, we will not tolerate those efforts in front of our fans paying money to see us play. I don't know, Biz. I'm, I'm obviously old school in a lot of ways, but it's fucking you two at the Sphere, man. Come on. Like, they might never go back there. It's not like they were playing a football stadium or, or an arena, man. I, I mean, <laughs> it's like, fuck, man. I, I would be pissed off if I was All right, they're, not getting paid to go, they're not getting paid to go to the U2 at the Sphere. They're getting paid to win hockey games. When they right, get but they don't have a game that night. Two. They're going on a fucking off night, man. I mean, they still socialize. They still go to dinner and fuck around and do all the other shit. I mean, I don't know. I, I'd be fucking I'm with you, Ari. Right. I would have so. gave them each a little packet of shrooms. We would have been having a ball, oh. laughing our balls off. And then the next day, steam room yeah. right off to practice. Let's fucking go, boys. Battle drills. Yeah, I mean, you was that say, announced? Like, was that announced before they went and beat the Blues? Because um, they beat the Blues yeah. five two, and now <laughs> did you see? Did you see Bennington button Ev- Evangelista in the face? Did you see that, Biz? Yeah, he's in. Uh, he's that in full Bennington move. mode right now, and that's why St. Louis scares me. If they sneak in, they kind of got their they they got their swagger back, and so does Bennington, the snowman. Um, I know a guy who got a hundred to one ticket on. Wet, believe it or not, oh, the Blues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, yeah, man, they might get on it. everyone. <laughs> I, I do get about eight or nine messages scored, so what, what's it, eight, seven now? What a fucking shootout that is. But, yeah, anyways, man, I, I felt bad for the boys. They didn't get to see you, too. So, uh, you know who we might see soon? Phil Kessel. Uh, he's doing a conditioning stint up in Abbotsford, British Columbia, hoping to sign with the Canucks. We did talk to uh, Rick Talkett on the Chicklets cast the other night. Want to throw a clip of that on, uh, G, please? Uh, we've messaged a little bit, but I think it's more uh, for him to see where he's at. We got the, you know, the skills coach is going to work with him. You know, he's been off for 10 months, but the thing with Phil, he's a freak, right? He's a, he's a, he's a, he can do a lot of things. He's a sports freak, right? Um, so I don't know, I don't know where he's in shape. I know the one thing he can pass the puck, um, and we'll see where it goes. Like the first phase here is the next four or five days, see where he's at uh, physically before we even entertain anything from there. I mean, Biz, what do you what do you, what would you put the odds at that, that he's a Canuck could say two three weeks seventy percent eighty percent does his conditioning I guess a little bit off but you think he's a, almost a definite Canuck or what? Yeah, I I think uh, I think uh, watching him skate, I think they had like a double practice or whatever in the AHL, and he looked like he was struggling a little bit. It's not easy getting back up to pace, but uh, it's more for that guy just in the locker room. He's just a uh, he just adds that levity, especially for a team with with a core who doesn't have that much playoff experience. I think the only year they they made a run was when they went to the second round, right? Is that is that a when they went? To, I think they played against St. Louis in the bubble was the farthest that they've been with this core group. So aside from that, man, I just think that uh, it's important to have a guy around who can take take the edge off, and he's an important piece that's been around who can do that. And if you throw him in the mix. He's a guy who might pull two goals out of his ass. Who knows? But last year, he proved that he could be that guy who's in the locker room, who's not contributing as much, yet adding a lot, as you saw in our interview with Marchessault. Like, he said that him and Marchessault were going back and forth, and the whole locker room was loving it. It it almost it almost took your focus away from how big the challenge was to win the Stanley Cup. And I think that that's drastically important. Whit, what do you, what do you feel about it? I just think it's no risk, right? It's just like, all right, yeah, bring him in. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, you already had a team that's played so good all year. And and I think there was no chance he was going anywhere without a prior history. So him would talk. And I mean, before game seven, he's calling him out for like a pull-up competition. Like, it's obviously a guy who's been in all the big moments. His career has been awesome. So bring him in. And, and if it works out, awesome. And if it doesn't, no worries. So it makes sense to me. Um, I, I figured he would he would be somewhere at, at one point. I mean, I know he wasn't a part of the a big part of the playoffs for Vegas, but he wasn't bad in the regular season. What do you have? Fifteen goals last year. So if he can get into shape, and I think it'll all come down to like how he looks down in Abbotsford when he's skating. If they can get, him. I mean, all the clips were funny. It was like this guy's dying right now. No shit. He probably he hasn't been in a legit pro practice and eight, nine months, whatever it's been. So he's going to be dying a little bit and and winded. But if he figures it out and goes up to Van and is comfortable there and gets put in the lineup and, and signs with that team, I love the move because there's there's zero risk to it whatsoever. Just get a, get a cup champion in a locker room for a team that's trying to go on a run. Yeah, he hasn't played since uh, April 23rd of last year. So I hope he gets back in the league, Ben. I hope more than anything else, when he's done playing, he comes on this fucking show because... I don't. I feel like he'd be one of the fucking funniest guys that we we'd ever have on the show. But either way, we're rooting for Kess to get back in the NHL. Uh, a few milestones this week as well. Congrats to my neighbor, uh, Brad Marchand, 
played his 1,000th NHL game versus Tampa last week. Uh, he's in his 15th season already. Holy shit, 912 points in 1,002 games. And uh, also, uh, Vegas demon Alex Petrangelo also played his 1,000th game versus L.A. But did you see what they did? Something a little different. Instead of the, the silver stick, they gave him a golden stick. And they actually presented it to him before he actually played in the 1,000th game. That was a little something different. What yeah. do you mean? When, when did they give it to him? Before he played in the 1,000 Yeah, normally games. they wait to, to the next game, before yeah, the next games. game to do, or a few games in some cases, to your back home. So they presented it to him on 999 before. But I mean, fuck, man. Like, you, if you get through warm-up, like, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're there. Oh, yeah, no. You're no, there. no yeah, I'm not bitching about it. It's just interesting. Oh, okay. they, he didn't go with silver stick. They gave him the gold stick because, obviously, Vegas Golden Knights. I thought, oh. I thought that was an interesting little touch, something a little bit different. But I bet you he gets the silver, too. But they just wanted to give him the gold one. So he's going to get two sticks. I can't believe St. Louis didn't re-sign him. Yeah, that was a fumble. Like, the fact that he's, you know, he's gone on to win another Stanley Cup as, as one of the few true number one defensemen in the league. Like, that guy can do it all. Incredible career. Hall of Famer, for sure. And, and no doubt, like him and Marshawn, like the way they've done it for this long and they keep producing. So Petro isn't slowing down either, man. That guy, I remember in camp with him, Biz, I didn't know how good he was. And then you just see him like, he's another human breakout, like Adam Fox, right? He gets it. He's either moving his feet and making it on, on his own skating or he's snapping it up tape to tape. Just been an incredible player, like drafted high. Everyone knew what he could do and he's lived up to everything. I skated with him when they were in uh, St. Kitts when he was playing for the Niagara Ice Dogs. And when he was like 16, 17 years old. Could already old, tell. Oh, yeah. He was like big, could skate well. The one thing at St. Louis camp that got even better, though, was like the way he defends and how well of a skater he is. You never had any time with the puck. He would have been closed in on you, stick on puck, and then body like shortly thereafter. Where <laughs> we were doing those one on will one on one drills down the ice as a forward, I'd basically just fucking throw it in the bench. Like fucking next, next. You know, you said when you would look down the line, it was Crosby, and you would, you know, oh okay, well, oh my skate lace, yes. Oh I'll shit, Orp, uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, but uh, yeah, same thing. He's he's a freak and and still doing it. Both guys, Hall of Famers. You still better not pay for a parking ticket for Brad Marchand under RA's watch, though. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's funny. I saw his vehicle out there a couple months back, and there was a ticket on it. I was going to take a picture of it, but I, I don't want to put his fucking vehicle out there. But man, I still think get he must have a him. guy who he just hands <laughs> these tickets to and takes care of them. Yeah, or well, he just dude. he's one of those guys that puts the old one on just to just maybe think the guy's not going to give him a new one. It's a good trick. Do that when when I owned a vehicle. Uh, guys, did you see Brant Clark's first NHL goal Saturday? Oh. Unbelievable, dude! It comes out of the penalty box, OT breakaway. Boom, I know it was against my Bruins, but it was an unbelievable goal. One of the, I mean, there have been a ton of first goals we've seen this year, but that's one of the best I've ever seen with coming out yeah, of the box. He's sick. coming he's... up at the perfect time, too. They needed something. Kind of like they're getting Mc, McMahon in Toronto. He's that guy for, for L.A. right now. He's, he's silky smooth, man. Like For that to be your first goal, that's one of the best ones I've seen. Um, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, like, and also, you kind of forget, like, Brock Faber was an L.A. pick, man. And oh. then they dealt him in that. I think it was the Fiala. Fiala. Deal. So yeah. they're they're kind of going to need Clark to pop off because you look at Faber right now. He's like McAvoy, dude. Faber, rookie of the year. Give it to him. So and it, it's just they're going to need like this young defenseman to come in. And I think he's at the point like similar to Juracek and Columbus. Like he, the AHL, like buddy, like you can't do any more, right? Like you have to get him up. You got to get him ice time. So. LA seems to be turning a corner, man. They had that. They had the. They had the win against the Bruins in overtime. Then they get those Kempe goals to beat Pittsburgh on Yager night, and something's going there now. Oh, also that kid for the Bruins, there, uh, Justin. How do you say Brizzo? They just signed him a couple days ago. His first game with the Bruins today. He got a goal. His very first. I game. saw Elliot tweet about him. I guess he had sixty-one goals one year in the O. Was never drafted or anything. So. I mean, I know you've seen a lot of guys, maybe they're overagers or whatever, but light up like the, the major junior rank and have these huge seasons, like one of their last few in junior. But I mean, you had 61 goals, dude. You know what you're doing around the net. And it was a great pass he buried, but still nice little signing. And what a cool story to just battle like all the way and never be drafted and light up junior and get your first NHL goal first game. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> good shit. Uh, Connor McDavid, we haven't mentioned him for a while. Had a career-high six assists versus Detroit last week. Uh, his second career six-point game. 
Uh, he's the fifth Oiler to have at least two six-point games. Obviously, Wayne leads the pack with 22. Yari Curry had four. Uh, Coffee and Anderson each had a pair. Uh, his third assist that night was the 600th of his career in his 616th game, uh, the fourth fastest ever. Uh, Wayne did it in 416 games. Mario, 514. Uh, and Bob Ewer at 608. So, again, it seems like every other week we're talking about what, him or, or Nate Dogg was just getting mentioned with these legends. They just keep climbing these fucking these He's now, ladders of success. He's n- now so, leading the league in assists, too. So we talk about the three guys who are probably up for the MVP right now. Like, can't count this guy out. I know it's crazy to think that I have him outside the top three, and some people will disagree with me. But by the end of the season, he's probably going to be in the top three. Fuck, he might even still win the thing. He is catching yeah. massive fire right now. My thing with the Oilers, my thing with the Oilers is like they bring in Perry. He's playing on the first line now. I think he's got two goals now, and 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 then Bouchard. Like I know I've talked about him a lot. This guy is keeps getting better and better, and they have like a true power play quarterback with one of the hardest shots in the league. He had two goals uh, against Dallas, including the OT winner, and like he's just he's an awesome player. So Edmonton. Everything continues to go well. They had a couple little hiccups here, but man, they're they're in Arizona right now. It was two one last time I checked, but I don't know. Beating Dallas in Dallas, the, the, I don't. I would love to know the last like fifteen years. Granted, the Oilers have been bad for a lot of those years, but it, Dallas is a house of horrors for them. So to get that win, that was huge. And yeah, they're going, man. They they they're gonna. They're probably gonna trade their first round pick. Maybe they throw in Broberg and get an enormous return. I don't know, but you know, this is a go for it year. And Ken Holland's moving that first round pick, no doubt. House of Horrors. I like that. Oof. Uh, the Nate saying. Dog. Uh, Nate, he had a goal and an assist on Sunday to extend his season open and home point streak to 26 games. He passed Bob Ewer uh, for the second longest ever after, guess who? Wayne Gretzky. Uh, he had 40 with the 89 Kings. And at 26 home games, Nate's got 22 goals, 33 assists, 55 points. Uh, in the season, 56 games, he's got 91 points. Uh, the fastest avalanche or Nordique to hit 90 points since Peter Stasty way back in 1988. He also did it in 56 games. So these guys are just unreal, man. I like to give them props when they're doing shit like yeah, this. Yeah, and I want to shout out my buddy Chris Wagner. Um, he's been a really good NHL player for a long time, and this year he signed a two-way with Colorado, and like seven minutes later he tore his Achilles. It was just such a kick in the dick for him. So he's able to battle back and I mean, oh no golf all summer. That absolutely blows. The guy's a golf junkie. But he he got healthy. He's been playing in the minors, got called up, played his first game when they beat uh Arizona yesterday, I believe, Sunday. So I'm really happy for him. Who knows? He gets up there. I saw he had three hits and played, I don't know, seven, eight minutes and, and all of a sudden maybe he can kind of get a role there on the on the on the fourth line and, and and figure out a way to be a part of that lineup moving forward. So I know Nichushkin's out. Um they might have a couple other injuries, but I was happy for him. Did you talk to him at all about like the 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 process and like maybe where the pain's at now? He feel he feels great now. He feels awesome. He said it was a struggle, man. That rehab's hard and it, it's like long and it's just tedious but he feels really good so it's, it's just good to hear because that injury man it's oh that's a rough one yeah well hopefully wags gets back out there man he's a he's a great guy great kid so uh we want to send our, our best wishes to lanny mcdonald uh, it's great to hear he's doing well uh he suffered a cardiac event when he in calgary's airport returning from the all-star weekend in toronto actually he had to spend two weeks in the hospital but uh two nurses happened to be in the airport they went over just dropped everything sprang into action he said i owe them my life like just the, the randomness of two strangers, you know, saving his life. And uh, he said he has, quote, new and improved pipes, some fancy hardware and a figuratively full heart. He took a picture in front of the hospital with like a you know, stuffed animal heart or whatever. So Lanny McDonald, I know you guys are a little younger than me, but uh, absolute legend of the game. I love watching him win that cup at 89. So Lanny, glad to see you doing well, pal. And uh, get well soon. So boys. Wait, 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 wait. Real the- quick, real yeah. quick, guys. A very, very, very special happy birthday to our guy, Ryan Whitney. Thank you, boys. No Thank shit. Thank you very much. Thank you How very old? Much. 41 today. Fucking A. Round get, of applause get, get for Ryan there, Whitney. Boys. Getting up. You Actually, enjoy fu- the day, Wade. You deserve it. You snap so many passes tape to tape. Today's your day, buddy. That a boy, Wit. Wait, and actually, I got one one question for you before you go since it's your birthday, and I know you'll love this one. So they did the DraftKings Challenge with the 41 free throws with Dave, Big Cat, the whole whack pack at the Chicago office. Now, there's rumblings that we'll be doing a hockey-related DraftKings-type 
a crazy thing to accomplish. What is it that people are talking about that we should do related to hockey where it's an insane thing that would be very difficult to accomplish? I, I don't know. We talked about either like hitting posts in a row, but posts. I think it would be better if we get a shooter tutor and everyone, if you don't know shooter tutor, you put it on the net and you can score top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left, five hole. And something where we have to hit like 30 in a row and like RA and Big Cat and Portnoy have to hit it. Like, because here's the thing about these streams is, is you don't want to be able to do it quick. Now, if we're an hour 40 and we're ready to kill each other, I could really regret that. But it's almost like if you could guarantee you could get something in the 15 to 20 hour range. And I know this sounds crazy. And Merle's on game notes. He's saying, I'm going to quit. Take a hike, Mur. I ain't quitting. I'll be the I'll be a vibes guy. People thought Minahan would be miserable. He was the ultimate vibe guy during the free throw competition. He was the guy pumping everyone up. That'll be me. So I don't know. I think it's a shooter tutor where like I don't I so apparently they have numbers guys to like run through and figure out like the odds in doing it. I guess it was a hundred thousand to one that those guys would hit forty one straight free throws. But then they ended up bringing in ringers and former college basketball players to kind of get it done. But Big Cat had to hit thirty nine forty and Portnoy had to hit the forty first. So it would it would end up being something where we'd have to hit a certain amount on a shooter tutor in a row. So, and the reason you say the shooter tutor is because you want it done at the uh, Chicago office because all the cameras are set up. Yeah. I thought it would be a good idea is if maybe like Chicago's out of town for a couple days, we could use the United Center and go back to <laughs> I think that. they got stuff going on there like every night. Well, like, maybe what if, we have, what if we start there and then the Bulls have a game and like then we have to go live in one of the boxes and wait for them to take out, out all the boards and just have the ice again to where maybe we go back to that half ice shot or the far blue line where how many guys in a row get have to make it in the small little hole when they put the shooter tutor on. Dude, that would, the, that would that would be in a row, man. Like I think that would and, actually be impossible. There's oh 10 G we would legit be there the rest of our <laughs> lives because if we had like big cat to do I think to do like four in a row of from center ice getting the puck in that little hole in the middle would maybe take years. No I, way. I, you I, and RA went back to back. Dude, that yeah, uh, that was so unlikely though. Exactly. Like you, I, and, and then to get another one and then another and one. And then another one. Hashtag what missed. I, that's probably the most but, impressive thing I've done on this this show is fucking hitting that shot. That's it. a race. But I think that I think if you could do it at the office and you get pucks and you get the shooter tutor and then like it would be a rule where if you've played hockey you can't score lower left or lower right. Like like me you and G would oh, have now to we're be getting scoring. Into the weeds. Okay, <laughs> let's have people who are listening to the end of the show here uh, throw in your um, like what you think maybe we should do from a hockey related challenge perspective. And it's got to be difficult, but yet something that has to eventually happen. Like 10 in a row, making it in that little hole. That's it. That biz. That is, it that is impossible. Yeah, that's Correct. Impossible. I agree with you. It is. Well, especially I think when you have guys like post, any post, crossbar, in a left row? post, right? In a row. I think, I that's think that 50? would be possible too, dude. No, it 50? isn't. We can do it. We can do it. How far are you talking here? From the, from the hash marks. Front hash marks, right? Man, in the slot. 50, okay, we're talking 41 free throws in a row. Took them 18 hours. And you're saying 50 posts in a row? Are you? No I question. Agree with, I agree with no What question. do you mean no question? I, Grinelli, what are you talking about? 50? I think no question we could do it. I think it would be easy. <laughs> I think it would be easier than you guys think it is what I mean to yeah, say. Yeah, we'll make you one of the shooters and you're the one at 49 who's going to fuck it all up. Done. Mr. Easy, I'll do dude, and we're gonna away. Easy. If we're including Ra and Big Cat and Dave, correct? Like, there's... what are you talking about? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I guess. I guess if you're including Ra, Big Cat, and Dave, I wasn't really thinking of that. But well, who else would it be? I was thinking I've... Biz. So Ray, Merles and Colby, Army need Mer to be involved in this. Merles and Army need to be in this. Hundred percent. Merles, they're hockey guys. <laughs> I mean. Uh. Yeah, let us know. Let us know what you think. So here's, as I mentioned, it can't be easy. It's got to be really hard. But the, the the aspect of like impossible can't can't be a can't be part of it either. Biz so. has to complete a tape to tape pass. <laughs> I, have I have to throw. A, I have to throw a body check. <laughs> I'll strap the pads back. On. Okay. One last time. <laughs> All right. Joe, sure, that's what you're waiting for. Yeah. All right, gang. Uh, All right, guys. Great show. Great interview. Hopefully, you all enjoyed it. Uh, 
that wraps up this week, and we'll see you next Chicklets week. TV. Have a great one. New episode of Chicklets TV, TV Wednesday, Toronto All Star Game. Game notes, and G's on the way to North Dakota for another Chicklets U. Have a good one, all. 